Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In his immortal comedy of manners, William Congreve wrote, Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. That was over 200 years ago. Have matters changed in the intervening centuries? Judge for yourself in this story, which happens today. Mark, who is it, dear? I thought you were sound asleep. All those pills. Oh, something woke me for the moment. I don't know why I came alive so suddenly. Some alarm bell in me. Which will never ring. You're not going to be alive. What are you doing with that pillow? Playing Othello to your desdemona, my love. No, Mark. Oh. You can't be serious. It's all just... <clears throat> Yet I'll not shed your blood, nor scar that whiter skin of yours than snow. Yet you must die. Put out the light. And then put out the light. If I can quench thee. Ah. No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. Our mystery drama, Hell Hath No Fury, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12 hour cold capsule, and Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Bud White. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Somebody still cares about quality. To the Budweiser people, that's a lot more than just word. It's a commitment to continue brewing Budweiser the way it's always been brewed. With care, with pride, without compromise. And it's a promise to everyone who enjoys great beer that there's one thing they'll always be able to count on. That one-of-a-kind Beechwood-aged Budweiser taste. A taste that speaks for itself. Loud and clear. Hear it talking? And when you say blood, you say you care enough to only want the king of beer. When you say blood, you say it all. 
Anheuser-Busch St. Louis. Save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam Hand Mixer, the Schick Style Dryer, a Presto Pressure Cooker and Wearing Blender. And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law. And get free gifts, too. From the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember, it's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. Mark Stanton and Emily Lawrence, the wedding of a decade. The first, a shining light of the classical theater. The second, a new, fresh, and lovely star of the screen who transcended any picture she illuminated. A public romance shared avidly by the fans that ranks with Romeo and Juliet, Eloise and Abelard, Desdemona and Othello, and which is destined to end as tragically. But to start a story, one must have a beginning, not an ending. So, let's go back a few days before Emily Lawrence's sudden and tragic death. Back to a meeting between Emily's half-sister, Elspeth Whitmore, and Mark Stanton. But who the devil... All right, Dodd, you better get your clothes on and be ready to scoot. I'll give you the high five. Uh, Hand me my gown, will you? Whoever it is, they aren't going to quit. Thanks, baby. Oh, it's you. Where did you get a key, Elspeth? One of the privileges of the family, even a half-sister. Well, come in. Why ring the bell when you have a key? I wanted to give you time to, uh, put your robe on. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just trying to snatch 40 winks. Oh, do I know her? Didn't she used to go under the name of Tiger Tilly, the jungle cat? Funny, very funny. Not to me, or would it be to my sister? Now, get rid of her, Mark. I want to talk to you. I will be in the living room on the phone, my back to the door, pretending your matinee curtain isn't coming down early. But don't think I won't sneak a look at what's your style this month, brother-in-law. B. Elspeth, anything stirring? Oh, how much? No, no, it's too low. They've got to come up with 700. Well, well, let them stew on it. I'll be back in the office soon. Huh? Oh, wait a sec. Uh, uh, no. Uh, no, I was just looking at a would-be rising star. Listen, if there's anything urgent, I'm at my sister's apartment. It's listed under Mark Stanton on the Rolodex, but it's still my sister's apartment. Bye. Well, Elspeth, to what do I owe this rather surprising early afternoon visit? <laughs> I thought agents were always busy during lunch hours. Oh, sorry to disappoint you. We take a breather now and then, don't you, ever? What does that mean? Well, didn't I surprise you hard at work? Now, look, Eleanor brought me a, a new treatment she wanted me to see. I'll bet she did. A screen treatment, a script. Okay, Casanova, it's enough banter. Are we alone in this joint now? Oh, don't tell me you want to open old books between us. No, this is a new one. We closed the other when you married my sister. Half-sister. You have to rub it in. I'm plain, flat-chested, and no hard hat ever whistled at my legs, but I still have brains. Uh, who needs them when you have Emily's 36, 24, 36, and even the members of the Union League Club look up from the Wall Street Journal when she moves by? Mark, sit down. I'm about to kick your feet from under you. What are you talking about? It's a pity you met me before Emily, isn't it, Mark? And needed me. I beg your pardon. Well, without an agent and one who cared, you were nothing but a stud. 
If I hadn't nursed and supported you through speech lessons, singing lessons, small parts, and nothing out of town... Now, damn you, I may not have had much education, but I always had talent. Oh, I'll grant you that. But you're lazy. And once you met Emily and knew she had all the looks and all the money, it was time to drop me. But don't forget Emily's money comes from being a film star. And I made her that. Let's forget past history. Mark, since I came back from Europe, I've been going over Emily's financial position. What right have you to... I happen to be her manager as well as her agent. And I don't like what I see. Emily has never made more in her life. You have never spent more. We have a front to keep up as two reigning stars. Hogwash. You're a successful ham who draws suburban ladies with delusions of culture and dreams of vicarious God knows what to the theater. You make peanuts compared to Emily and spend the kind of money she makes. A temporary loan or two. I have some pictures in the works. Oh, come on, Mark. You couldn't draw flies to a movie theater even in an exploitation film. So, I have talked it over with Emily. And, as uh, Harry Truman used to say, the buck stops here. (laughs) What does that mean? I'm putting Emily on an allowance. Enough to take care of her needs. You can handle the apartment and the rest. But no more play money, little boy. And uh, that's only the beginning. The next thing I'm going after is her will. Uh, The one that leaves everything to you. If anything should ever happen to my sister, I can think of better causes for her estate to serve than Mark Stanton, the heel of ham. Later, all my efforts to stay calm and unruffled meeting Mark again dissipated into thin air. Thank heaven I was alone. And my knees turned to water thinking and dreaming of him as once it had been between us. By the time I reached the ground floor, I knew I needed another session with Madame Erexo. Why do you imagine you can ever fail? You are one of us. I have always thought one of the strongest in the coven. I never have doubts except... except in one area. <laughs> Every Achilles has his vulnerable heel. Every witch her own weakness. We must fight always against the world to hold the true faith. Come, daughter. Let us pray together. Draw the drapes while I light the candles. Now, step within the magic circle with me. Yes. Oh, great Erexo, mother of us all, who crouch in the black shadow of your wings. I conjure thee from the instrument by Lucifer, prince of darkness, by all the stars which rule by the four elements, that we may obtain by thee the perfect issue of all our desires, which is also seek to perform without reason, without deception. We are answered. I know what I'm doing is right. Will it turn out that way? Will you read the tarot cards for me? I am your sister in fate. I am at your command. Sit down while I shuffle the cards. You know what that means without asking. The king of coins... A sign of ill omen. Was the question asked for yourself? No. I will ask one for myself now. Then cut. The ace of cups. That is a promise of beauty and fertility. For me? Uh, Why not? You are young. (laughs) Scarcely beautiful. One more question. One only. I'm asking it in my mind. Cut. The 
rod of death. The nine of swords. No. Not my sister. Not my sister. <laughs> I love you, Emily. I love you, Mark. Oh, now I feel relaxed and hungry. Good, good. Um, Elspeth was around this afternoon. Here? Why? Oh, being the big business manager, saying we were spending too much money. <laughs> She's smarter than we are about things like that. Yes, but is she really putting you on a strict allowance? Well, I guess I'll have to go along with her. She says I'm starting to spend more than I make. Now, how is that possible? Maybe you need a new business manager. Oh, nobody would be better than Elspeth. Hmm. Besides, she's got to make a living, too. And who would I get? Well, how about me? Oh, darling, you. You have no idea of the value of money. No, oh, well, I'm old and penniless. And if in his infinite mercy the man upstairs saves you from looking at me anymore and snatches you upstairs for himself, Elspeth tells me she'll be my guardian. Well, she does want me to make a new will. It wouldn't be a bad idea. We're both so stupid about how to handle what we've got. And if anything ever should happen to me... Oh, darling, please. I was only kidding. Let's get off this. No. As long as we got on it, I think Elspeth has the right idea. She'd see you didn't throw it all away. So I agreed. I'm going to remake my will on Monday. Well... Now, I've got to wash up, and you go tell the cook to get that dinner on the table. I am famished. Well, that tears it. Elspeth, Emily, one of you has got to go. Now, let's see. Which shall it be? Which can I get away with? Charming fellow, Mark Stanton. Matinee idol for a limited audience of aging women. His main role, Romeo. Although he has been seen with varying success critically as Orlando, Bassanio, Lysander, all Shakespearean lovers. Interesting casting when you think of it. Or as we learn about him. He might have made a better Claudius of whom his nephew Hamlet said that one may smile and smile again and be a villain. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Sneezing, drip, congestion. What next? Six or three or one. Is that an answer or a question? That's the question when you catch the common cold. For you, the answer is 12-hour contact. Why? Well, because you need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three cold pills, one every four hours, or just one contact capsule for up to 12 hours continuous relief of your sneezing, drips, and congestion. The tiny time pills do it. For aches and fever, the others contain aspirin. And contact doesn't. Right. So, six or three or one. Your cold, your choice. I'll take the one contact, thank you. Do you feel cold? Six or three or one. Take contact only as directed. The Marines are looking for a few good men. Men who want to learn good jobs. Today, a qualified man can choose the direction he wants to go in the Marine Corps. Choose the kind of skills he wants to learn. Like computers, aircraft maintenance, or electronics, radio communication, food services, aviation technology. You name it, Marines do it. If you want to learn it, the Marines will teach you skills, responsibility, and leadership in any field you can handle. Remember, qualified men can choose their own directions in the Marine Corps. Skills to learn, careers to build in many directions. Direction. The Marines are looking for a few good men who want to choose their own direction, want to learn good jobs, want to be Marines. A famous epitaph on a child's grave reads... It is so soon that I am done for. I wonder what I was begun for. 
That might apply to this story of Emily Stanton, or at least the plan that is forming in the mind of her husband, Mark. The problem with murder is not to want to commit it, but how. How to commit it and not be caught. One thing I knew, it would have to be out of the city. And fortunately, we have a place up the Hudson Valley, suitably isolated. Also, by sheer luck, Emily's picture was not shooting that weekend. Oh, what time is it, Mark? Mark? Did you call, my lady? <laughs> what on earth are you doing up at 5.30 in the morning? Uh, bringing the woman I adore beyond reason her orange juice. And coffee's on the way. Oh, you angel. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm so tired. I don't know how I'm going to make it to the studio today. I'll call them and tell them you're not well. No, no. Two more days and I have a whole long three-day weekend off. I'll bounce back then. Uh, speaking about the weekend, how about going up to the country? No, thanks. I want to just slump down here in bed and sleep and rest and hold in like a bear for his winter sleep. Oh, but darling, it isn't winter. It's spring. And I want to get up to the house. <sighs> that long drive. Well, you see, I'm worried. You know, I've got the hole dug in the fall. I've got to get that sump pump into the cellar before the spring waters flood us again. You can rest up there just as well. I can rest here and we can get some men to do the job. Oh, where were they last fall when we needed them? Can't we make it next weekend? Well, it'd um, be too late by then, I'm afraid. Oh, all right, darling. I never can refuse you anything. Everything I do is for you. Have is yours. Except for letting your sister run our lives. Oh, that's just money. Because neither of us know how to handle it. Well, what's it. it for except to buy things? Mm. Mm. Well, we can enjoy them. I mean, I'd feel like a fool having to run to Elspeth for the rent or something. Are you trying to get rid of me? Well, of course not, darling. How could you think a thing like that? <laughs> I don't. So stop talking about it. You'd only have to do that if I was dead, and I don't intend to be. I should hope not. Oh, look at the time. I've got to shower and dress and get out of here. How about lunch? I can't, sweetie. I have a, a business appointment. Well, a moment or two later, I wondered why I hadn't seen a mark when I went to this outfit. Then I decided it was better that I hadn't. And I wish I hadn't agreed to drag him up to the country house. <laughs> but he's really so beautiful and so sexy and so persuasive. It's awfully hard to refuse Mark anything. If I'd only known I'd picked the wrong thing to ever refuse him, I'd never have let Elspeth talk me into what she called having more doctrine. I mean, you can't give in to everything Mark wants to ask. He's a selfish child. That is his too well. Look, honey, take it from me. I found out the hard way. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring all that up here. Oh, forget it. I've forgotten Mark that way. Plant us two side by side and ask any man to choose. Which way would it go? Yeah, I'd never have come back from the coast a year ago if I'd known I was going to bust up the romance between them. Emily, you've been over this ground before. You didn't bust up the romance. There wasn't any to bust up it on my side. If Mark needed a good agent, it was not me. In more ways than one. So, for me, period. I'm so sorry, America. I wish I could make up for it. Well, you can. Two ways. Draw that will, making me executive to the estate, and let me budget your belt. It seems unfair to Mark. Listen, Emily, I don't want you to get your back up, but I get the word he has gambling debts, and if you think he has backing, he could go sky high. Now, just let me put the brakes on, okay? Uh, I suppose it's too much to hope that uh, your love for that muscle-bound Greek statue you married isn't letting up any. Mark? What would make you think of the last time? Oh, I don't know, just uh, an irrational hope, I guess. You still love him, don't you? That isn't the point. I love you, and I'm very concerned about you. What do you mean? I don't know. You'd, you'd only laugh at me if I told you. It's really funny, isn't it? I mean, uh, the genes. We both come from the same mother, but our fathers were so different. You, blonde, blue-eyed, open, uncomplicated, trusting. 
and me shut, feeding, shut tongues. Much of this world, and, and yet not. Now, what does that mean? I could never explain that to you in a millennium. Oh, I am a psychic. Do you have those funny cards you used to read and for telling what's going to happen and things like that? Yes, things like that. And now listen to me. This is a dangerous time for you. Be careful. Just be very careful. But I don't know what to do. I can only see so far. I can only warn you. Just be very careful. Oh, you are scared. I mean to. Well, it isn't only you. It's just that I... I have the weekend off, and Martha and I are going to the country. Oh, I really don't want to. I'm scared of the drive. You mean because of Mom and your father? Yes. Emily, how many times have I told you it wasn't your fault? It was in the car. I was driving when they were killed. And a drunken madman by fatal chance jumped the road divider and forced you off the road. What else did you have done? It was not your fault. I know, but I still have nightmares about it. You're not going to drive, are you? I'll never drive a car again. It's just, I'm afraid even to get in one. Now, excuse me for changing the subject, but you have to get back to the set soon. I want you to take a quick run up to my office. Why? Yeah. Harry is there now. I had him draw up a new will for you, and I think we ought to get it signed right away. Well, I don't know. Mark is quite a spirit, but Emily... If anything ever happens to you, I will take care of him the way he should be. You know you can trust me for that. Emily? Yes? Oh, you had your eyes closed. I thought you were asleep. That's not why my eyes are closed. Oh, darling, come on. You've got to put things behind it. Voice kept 
shouting at me to stay awake. Until I thought it's only punishment. Foolish to be afraid. I am in my beloved husband's arms. And how safe can I be? Is she still in danger? The nine of swords still threatens. But when? How soon? I cannot tell the thunder the cards. Maybe. Maybe I should call the country. May I use your phone? Of course. What danger can she be in with her husband? It's a very long drive. I know what those roads are like. Oh, damn. What head busy signal? Well, at least it means they got there, Susan. You wait for the mass tonight. Within the circle, more questions are answered than through the card. Be patient. I'll try. But I can feel death in my bones. Yes, you must die. Put out the light. And then put out the light. If I can quench things. No. Ah. No more moving. Still is the grave. My wife. My wife. I must have been mad, Emily, to have killed you. Because I do love you. Only that I love myself more. For money. For the need of it. What have I done? How do I cover it? with a car into the river at the devil's elbow. But the body must never be recovered. Then, who can prove anything? The grave is already made. Can I get away with it? Of course I can. I can get away with anything. No! What is it, Alistair? You interrupt the map. Oh, it's so... I can't take it, please. I can't you prophesied. I must leave. Give me permission to leave the magic circle. If the death is accomplished, what can you do? But go, if you must. Well, try it again, operator. Or get me someone who can make the connection if it's out of order. This is a matter of life and death. I love. On such a night, Troilus climbed the Athenian walls. <laughs> madness. The whole thing is madness. But there has to be a reason for Emily's death. The car smashing through the guardrail 500 feet to the river below. The car recovered, the body never. I will bury that 5,000 feet. And why should anyone question that Emily's body lies cemented in the well of a new sump pump planned over a year ago? No. Goodbye, my favorite car. The die is cast. The adversaries established. A murderer and a witch. By whom is justice best served? Which will prevail? If a woman has loved not wisely but too well, who can best revenge her? The majesty and justice of the law or a kangaroo court beyond and outside the law? I'll return shortly with Act Three. Inside your feet after all, you hear freedom spirit, like a wild bird call, inside your free, inside your free, after all, living free, living free. You're on the open road, 
Rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. mid-sized car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Nice choice, your Buick. ping pong all day. They're wrong. The USO isn't all fun and games. Today, the USO has millions of problems like this one in Germany. My family's going crazy living in a tiny apartment. Where can we live? Today's USO has millions of problems like this one in Asia. I'm hooked on drugs. Where can I get help? Or this problem in Athens. Our marriage is breaking up. Can you help us? Today's USO has little time for ping pong. We've got serious work to do. We've got lots of new problems here and overseas. The problems are big. How big? Well, if someone asks you, who needs the USO? Tell them, we do, we do. Over 5 million American military personnel and their families need today's USO. And because we get no government funds, we need all your support. Please give to USO through the United Way or local USO campaign. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78, the correct time, 1106, 30 degrees at Midway. Mark Stanton has deliberately murdered his wife. And he has had what seems to him a very practical means of disposing of body and suspicion which may work for normal authority, but possibly not for his sister-in-law, since he has no idea that she is a modern witch. For the moment, he is involved with simple but furiously necessary occupations. Uh, huh. That looks pretty good. Pump in its well, cellar floor replaced... Who'd ever find Emily or think to look for her here? What? What the devil? 3 a.m. in the morning. Who? <sighs> Damn. Lights are on upstairs. I better answer. Oh, Got to change first. Well, about time. Oh. I always seem to be surprising you in on Deshabille. Well, hmm? What do you expect at this time of night? All right, come in. That's about the first polite thing you've said to me in months. Oh, let's cut the funny talk. What are you doing up here in the middle of the morning? <laughs> An interesting phrase. Shouldn't it be the middle of the night? All right, all right. Let's bury the New York smart talk. What do you want? To see my sister. She isn't here. Oh? Why not? <sighs> she had a five o'clock call on location for sunrise shots. So she decided to drive back last night and have the limousine take her on location this morning. What made you take a two-hour drive out here at this time of night? I'll tell you half of it. I was scared, if that means anything to you. Well, it doesn't. What's the other half? I won't tell you that yet. Although someday you just might have to learn. I won't even pretend to understand that. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm Mark Stanton. What? Where? No, no, never mind all that. How is she? No, I'll be right down there. What was that? Emily. Her car went out of control at, at Devil's Elbow. Oh, no. She went through the guardrail, plunged 500 feet down into the river. The, the car's a total wreck. Never mind the car. What about Emily? I, well, I haven't found her yet. The car windows were open. If she got swept down the river and into the lake, they may never find her. You mean she's dead? You, you don't have to. What else? A plunge like that? The, the car totaled? What else is there to think? Nothing. Emily is dead. What? That's a strange way to... Oh, Elspeth, I'm sorry. This must be terrible for you, too. It is terrible for me. But not too. Huh? What does that mean? I mean you killed her. How could you think a thing like that. I don't think. I know. But it isn't going to do you any good. 
It was all for nothing. I don't know what you mean. You will. When I'm ready to tell you. Right now, let's go to the scene of the... What shall we call it, Mark? Let's just say... The tragedy. Okay, boys, use the crowbars. Get those doors open. Go over the inside. Check the ignition key, huh? Oh. Uh, you Mr. Stanton? Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm Mrs. Stanton's sister. I do, ma'am. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry about this. My wife, you... You think she's dead? What can I say? A fall like that, and then, um... And... And what? Well, ma'am, this here shoe... One of my men found its mate washed ashore just before the river empties into Lake Cahokawa. Right down near where the car landed in the river, we found your sister's pocketbook. It don't look good. Can't her body be recovered from the lake? We'll try, but that lake bottom is soft mud or whatever you want to call it from all the leaves the trees have been dropping for millions of years. It's like, like a quicksand. Nobody who ever drowned in that lake ever was seen again. Oh, my God. Look, uh, why don't you go on home, Mr. Stanton, and take Miss, uh, take your sister-in-law with you. As soon as I'm finished up here, I'll drive up. There are some questions I'll have to ask. Well, what do you mean, was Emily exceptionally tall? Well, for a woman, I meant. Actually, my sister was quite small. Two inches shorter than I am. And I'm only 5'4". Well, all right, yes, Emily was quite tiny, but what difference does that make? The driver's seat was adjusted for somebody as tall as, well, say you, sir. Oh, well, it could have been knocked back in the crash, couldn't it? Yes, sir, it could. Uh, was your wife wearing gloves when she left? Gloves? I... Why? Driver's wheel had no fingerprints on it. I just wondered. Oh, yes, yes. Now I remember. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, yes, she did have gloves. You drive with gloves, Mr. Stanton? Oh, yes, yes, usually. And the uh, car is on constant maintenance at the garage. Yes, sir. All right, just one more question for now. Were you alone in the house when the accident happened? Oh, I suppose I must have been. Oh, I was just wondering if your sister-in-law was also here. I... I arrived shortly before Emily left. I had planned to drive her into town this morning. We had some business to discuss, but when she insisted on leaving last night, I was just too tired to make the trip, and I had brought Mark a new script. Since Emily was taking Mark's car, I decided to stay, let him read the script, and we could drive in tomorrow discussing it and return it on time. Uh, Well, I guess that closes things up for me. Sorry to have taken so much time. My condolences, Mr. Stanton. I, 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 I hope we can find your wife. He is just as certain of it as I am. You murdered Emily. What are you saying? The truth. If you believe that, why did you alibi me? I wanted to spike the sergeant's suspicions, at least temporarily. What are you up to? Um, at the moment, not very much. I want to sleep on all of this. Oh, by the way, don't entertain any ideas of getting rid of me. You see, brother-in-law, dear, I happen to be exactly what you think of me. A witch. Only I am a real one. And because I am what I am, I can feel... Her presence in this house. If I told the police what I know, they'd search it from top to bottom. Because of someone who claims to have ESP, they'd write you off as a nut. Mark, you haven't a leg to stand on. On Wednesday, last Wednesday when we had lunch, I arranged for Emily to change her will. It was finalized before you drove up here Friday. I am executrix and control every penny. Oh. I'm too tired to talk about it now. After I've slept on it, I'll decide your future. I suggest you get some rest to prepare for it. I would 
wouldn't have bet a plugged nickel I could get any sleep out of what was left of the night. But a bottle of brandy and sheer emotional exhaustion from fright put me to sleep in the library chair. The last thing I remember was a whirling confusion of surrealistic plots for disposing of Elspeth. I even finally believed what I'd always thought of her. That she was a witch. I was sick with grief and desperately tired. But I couldn't go to sleep. Every time my eyes closed, I seemed to hear a voice. I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up, went downstairs. I saw Mark passed out in the library, a brandy bottle in his hand. And the voice was closer. The voice threw me to the cellar. And there, beside the furnace, I knew it at last. The fresh cement. Still drying, beautifully blended and tapered into the old surface. Now I knew where my sister was. Now I knew exactly what I had to do. I now pronounce you, Elspeth Garrick Whitmore, and you, Mark Blaine Stanton, man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Ah, home sweet home. So, you got me at last, Elspeth. That's right, Mark. My dear husband. And no way out for you. One word from me and Sergeant Harkness would dig up that cellar and you'd spend the best part of your life in jail for murder. I'm grateful to you, of course. But some things I... I still don't understand. Oh, you will. Happy, darling. Just give your bride a few minutes to slip into something fetching, and we'll start to begin our married life. I promise you'll find me all I told you I really am. Bewitching. I damned her under my breath for what she claimed to be. I found a longing ache for Emily and what she'd been to me. I seethed at being emasculated, at having to act like a pet poodle at the hopelessness of my situation. I dreamed of the thousandth plot to get rid of Elspeth. Oh, an idle dream. I'd gotten away with it once, never again. And then... She called me into the bedroom. Come, lover boy. Oh, oh good Lord. No. <laughs> You didn't really believe I was a witch, did you? You're not Elspeth, you're... You're Emily. I've borrowed her aspect. Does it please you? Yes, I... I, I love you. I, I want you. Oh, Emily, my beloved. Elspeth, Mark, not Emily. Only her aspect, which you will live with every moment we're at home. Oh. But you will not touch me. Either as myself or my sister you killed. I... I don't understand. I want to be sure you can't get away with it. A good lawyer, your own natural charm, a long, bitter trial, the possibility of escape. And even if they found you guilty, there is no death penalty, so... My way's better. No money. No freedom. And the remembrance every day of the crime you committed. The girl you murdered to haunt you fresh and lovely while you grow old and forgotten. This is your cell, Mark. Plush-lined, perhaps, but more confining than anything state or government could devise. And I am your jailer. Watching you die a little day by day, year by year. I've read it in your cards, traced it in your horoscope. You will have a long hell on earth before the spirit I worship welcomes you to the real hell for eternity. This is my revenge for my sister and for myself. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be. Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned nor hell, no fury, like a woman scorned. 
For this story, there is no ending. A man bought only what he deserved. I'll be back shortly. See if you can identify these sounds. Squeaky door. Lion growling. A motor scooter. Cow mooing. Spanish dancer. If you agreed with these guesses, you've been fooled. Because each sound was made by a whale. That's right. A great big blubbery old whale just buzzing and clicking and grunting away deep down in the ocean. The National Audubon Society has joined a world effort to save these amazing animals from extinction. We need your help. To find out what you can do, write National Audubon Society, 953rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022. while, Mark Stanton's matinee ladies wondered about his abrupt retirement. But the Gorgon who guarded him fiercely finally discouraged their attentions. Not Elspeth alone. His good looks began to fade strangely, till by the time he was 35, his haunted, gaunt face and emaciated body looked more like a man in his 70s. He eventually was committed to a state institution for the insane, and died there without even an obituary to mark his passing. Mysteriously and suddenly, Elspeth died on the same day. Our cast included William Redfield, Patricia Wheel, Terry Keene, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'll tell you why I called you, Sam. Your favorite parolee, Steve Janos, was just in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what a big football fan you are. Me, it's the ponies. What's on my mind? I don't know. The Cleveland police just sent me down a picture of that wife of his. And... Huh? No, <laughs> no. She's not marked up in what I'm looking at. Sensational looking doll. Too good to just pass up. What I want to know is, how are you coming on that trace you've had out on her? Yeah. Well, the moment anything turns up, you get on the pipe. Even tonight, I'll be here late. I wouldn't want to know that your boy and this girl were in the same town. That could be begging for trouble. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. What is it? I don't know, Miss Avery. Does your flashlight still work? It's almost dead, but this I think we must see. 
Oh, my God. The whole floor seems to be alive, flowing like a river. Yes, flowing towards us. Here comes Monk Mayfair, the ape-like chemist. Blazes! Ham Brooks, the sword-wielding lawyer. Take that! Rennie Renwick, the two-fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. Pipe down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. I'll be super amalgamated. And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. The Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, Terror Underground, Chapter 5 of the fantastic story Fear Key. Doc Savage and his crew have trailed the Fountain of Youth gang to Fear Key, a remote island in the Caribbean. There they encounter a mysterious force that turns men into skeletons in a matter of minutes. After foiling the gang's attempt to blow up their plane, Doc and Kel Avery trail the leader Santini to an underground labyrinth and discover that the gang is trying to find a secret cache of some valuable substance left there years before by old Dan Thunden. Eavesdropping on the gang's conversation, Doc discovers that Thunden has double-crossed the gang and intends to sell the secret himself. But just as Doc is on the verge of learning more, Santini discovers his presence, and Doc and Kel Avery rush headlong into the darkened caverns in an attempt to escape. Which way? Back along the corridor. Perhaps there's another way out. I think they're gaining on us. Can you open it? I don't find any handle or fastener. And the hinges are on the other side. Can, can you break it down? No good. It's too solid. What do we do? Wait, there's a small depression near the top of the door. Let me see if I can get my finger through that narrow crack. Yes, there's a small lever on the other side. There. Quick, inside. No, I don't see any lock, and there's nothing to bar it with. Can they shoot through the door? I don't think so. It's too thick. Look, they know about the lever. There's a hand coming through the opening. I'll take care of that with my flashlight. They'll probably try sticking a gun through next. Yes, here it comes. A machine gun barrel. And right next to the door, I don't think they can swing the barrel far enough to hit around us there. Undoubtedly. Come on. While they said it, we'll try to find another exit. That did it. They're through now. Oh, what's up ahead? Looks like the pile of clothing. Yes. I wonder... Oh, no. It's another skeleton. Not just any other skeleton. It's the lawyer, Hallett. Or what? Yes, I can tell by the clothing. Look up there. Trap door, just like the one we fell through. That's how he disappeared so fast from the jungle. But that happened just a few minutes ago. How could it be a skeleton so fast? That's a mystery we have yet to solve. But we can't wait here. Santini and his gang will find us soon. How much farther can we go? I don't know. These caverns could run for miles under the island. But perhaps we don't have to go very far. Why? See that indentation in the wall? It's deep enough for both of us to get into. Out of sight of this passage, they just might pass us, unaware that niche exists. Do you think it will work? Let's put it this way. I think it's our best chance. All right. We got him now, Santini. We must have. You fool leaking. We do not know that. There may be another exit from this passage. Haven't you explored all of this place? No, no. On my first visit here, when we found the older man, Dan Thunden, we did not pry into this place. It was not healthy. 
Didn't old Thunden trust you when you was here the first time? Yeah, Shorty's got a point. It seems like Thunden had been glad to see the first white man in over 90 years. He'd have fallen all over himself to show you around. He must have been a shrewd old bird even then. Enough! We must have find the savage! Wait! What's that? I don't hear anything. What's the fact here? Listen! I'm getting out of here! Let me do! Run! Run! Mr. Savage? What is it? I don't know, Miss Avery. Does your flashlight still work? It's almost dead, but this I think we must see. Oh, my God! What is it? The whole floor seems to be alive, flowing like a river. Yes, this explains a lot. Your flashlight just went out. Run, Miss Avery. Back the way we came. Feel your way as best you can. I'll be right behind you. Very oh, but it's extremely dangerous, nonetheless. You know what it is. I think so. But later for that, we've got to find a way out. Look, up ahead, light. Yes, sunlight, unless I'm mistaken. A hole in the ceiling and a ladder up to it. This must be their main entrance to the cavern. It's a quick way out, but it must be guarded. Do we have any choice? I suppose you're right. Come on. No one around. Up you go. Hey, here's the prom toy. Do not let him escape. Hurry. Hurry, Miss Avery. I can't. The ladder's shaking. Shaking? Jump off, quickly. Where? Anywhere. Too late. Whoa. Whoa. What happened? Another trap. This time in the floor of the cabin. Where are we? Well, some kind is my guess. About eight feet around, 20 or so feet deep. It's the thug, Shorty. Here's where I fix everything. Wait, senor. Don't let us shoot them yet, huh? Why the hell not, said he? I'm a swing in a minute ago. Because of my short friend, I have a big idea. Idea. You see, we will make a Mr. Bronze man do a job for us. Oh, yes. A very special job. <laughs> Johnny, long time. Did you hear that? Indeed, Rennie. A percussion with the characteristics of a firearm. Uh, I say we look into that. Doc set us to hunt an old Dan Thunden. Remember long time? And a fine lot of luck we've had. The old geezer gave us a slip like a ghost. We're wasting our time prowling around here. Let's see what that shot was. A recommendation of acumen. Uh, the shot came from about here. I think it was farther on, long time. Uh-uh. It was muffled, like it was fired in a hole or something. Let's look around and see if there's a pit or a cave in these rocks. Well, I'll be super amalgamated. What is it, Johnny? I've been ascertaining our whereabouts. It was precisely here that we sighted Dan Thunden. The fellow traversed a convolutionary course prior to his evanescence. What? I didn't get that last. That means that Thunden prowled around a lot before he vanished. <laughs> You're going to choke on those big words someday, Johnny. Come on, let's keep looking. Say... What happens if we run into that Santini bird instead of Thunder? I uh, got your super machine pistol with you, don't you, Rennie? Sure. Loaded with Doc's anesthetic mercy bullet? Yep. Uh, that's your answer. Hey, there. What the? Over there. Damn Thunder. He flattened before I could line up my first shots. There he is again. He got the cover. Come on. There he is again, over there. He must know every inch of this island to get around like that. That fellow has the agility of an acrobat. There he is again, down by the beach. For a lad 131 years old, he takes the cake. Now he's over there. Hey, wait a minute, fellas. What's the idea, Rennie? Yes, elucidate. I just got wise to something, fellas. Old Snowy Whiskers is pulling a fast one on us. He's showing himself deliberately to lead us where he wants us to go. We're being decoyed. Okay, imminently probable. Okay. Now that we know what he's doing, we'll keep our eyes open. But I'm still in favor of giving him a chase. Me too, Long Tom, but let's be more careful. Agreed. Agreed. 
Yes. He's careful not to let us lose his trail. He's obviously leading us to some spot he wants us to visit. Strange way for him to act. Uh, no stranger than his warning us that that bomb was in our plane. Just let me get my hands on him. He'll tell uh, me. You said it. And the first thing he'll explain would be just what turned that aviator into a skeleton so fast. I say, look up ahead. He's halted. Yeah, and he's got a finger to his lips and pat in the air with his other hand. That seems to be asking us to be quiet and careful. Now he's going into the jungle. Perhaps he's... No! Oh. Ready. Fire around in that mess of mangroves. Oh. You got it! He'll be unconscious before we can get to him. That was one of Santini's gang. I recognize the voice. I'll say you sound awful, Johnny. Those cracked ribs bothering you? Uh, No. That's a dang lie. You're about played out. Blast it. You ought to be in a hospital. You stay behind us. There he is. Yeah, he's out. He's not hurt bad. Let's see where he was headed. We're almost to the beach. Say, you smell anything? Yeah, Long Tom. Smells like gasoline. Holy cow, look! A seaplane beats right on the shore. Well, covered with palm fronds and boughs to camouflage. That's why we didn't see it from the air. Look, over there, a hut with the roof camouflaged with thatch. And three of Santini's men, guards. A round of mercy bullets will put them out soon enough. That did it. Come on. Wait, wait a moment, fellas. They seem to be folding up. Huh? I'll be... I'll be super amalgamated. Johnny's broken ribs must be worse than he thought. Right. Pick him up. And bring him along. Uh, let's go. You wait here with Johnny. I'll climb through the palm fronds and look around inside. What is it, Long Tom? Well, come in here and look. Holy cow, the wings are all torn up. Yeah, the fuel tanks show empty on the gauges. That's why we smell gasoline. Looks like they were slashed with something like a small axe. Yeah, pretty good job of vandalism. Wonder who did it. You gentlemen did a good job there, but your work isn't done yet. London, just let me get one shot. Wait. Santini's gotten a hold of your boss, Doc Savage. What? You better help, Savage. Just tag along behind me and I'll show you what to do. Wait! No use, Rennie. He's already gone. Well, come on. Let's follow him. Jane, do I get any attention here or not? That's Pat. In the hut? Pat, are you all right? Except for this piece of piano wire tied around my waist, I'm okay, I guess. Yeah, you're tied to the back brace of the hut. Let me get that wire. Now you'll need pliers. They tied it with pinchers. I've been twisting it and kinking and unkinking it for hours with no luck. I got some pliers in my knapsack. You all right, Pat? I am madder than a tomcat caught in a rat trap. Hey, what was it I heard that old whiskered goat yelling about Doc? Some about Santini having gotten him. But I don't believe it. Doc has never been in a jam yet where he didn't have an ace up his sleeve. Did Santini ever find out you weren't Kel Avery? Oh, no, Long Tom. I wouldn't be here if they had. They'd have thrown me out of the plane if they'd known who I was. <laughs> they very nearly did it anyway. They probably kept you alive in hopes of making you tell them where the contents of that parcel went to. That's right. Where did it go? You think I know? Ask that other girl, that, that Kel Avery or Maureen Darling or whatever she calls herself. Uh, you don't seem to like her. I don't like anybody who got me into what I've just gone through. <laughs> I thought you wanted to be amused by a little excitement. This has gone past the amusement stage. <laughs> ah, there. Oh, thanks, Ernie. Let's see if anything really has happened to Doc. Hey, look, down the beach. It's Sunday. Hey, you! Come here and tell us what this is all about! Here's your answer. He disappeared into the jungle. Now, for two cents, I'd shoot him for a good hard lead the next time he shows his nose. I wouldn't, Long Tom. Why not? He's on our side. At least until we clean up on Santini's outfit. Well, where'd you learn that? From Santini's talk. Well, if Thunder is going to lead us to Doc, we better get to following him. All right, Rennie. You got Johnny? Yep. Okay, let's go. (laughs) 
You suppose Thumden's going to keep in sight so we can follow him? I think so. Look, there he is up ahead. Yeah, he's leading us, just like before. Right toward that rocky area near the center of the key. Pat, did Santini's talk tell you anything else? Plenty. And it is the most fantastic story you ever heard. This Sam Thunden was shipwrecked here in 1843, more than 90 years ago. He was the only one from his ship to reach shore, and he's lived here ever since. Well, I've still got my doubts about that guy being 131 years old. Santini doesn't seem to doubt it, and he's nobody's sucker. What else did you learn? Santini found this island by accident. He was flying from South America in a stolen plane. He'd gotten into some trouble down there over killing a government official in Venezuela. He was making for the United States after leading everyone to believe he was flying south. Well, that makes sense. He wouldn't be able to take the usual air routes or fly over islands where there were settlements and radio. That would explain why he happened to come over such an out-of-the-way corner of the Caribbean as this. Right. And he had motor trouble and landed here on Fear Key. Well, then what? Well, then the mystery darkened. He found Dan Thunden and something else. Something worth a great deal of money. What? Search me. Uh, you mean to say you don't know yet what all this fighting is over? No, Rennie. I tried to pump Santini, but got nowhere. They were very glad to learn that I didn't know what was behind the trouble, and I had to be very careful not to let them discover that I wasn't Kel Avery. So Santini and his gang came back to Fear Key to get more of the stuff which was supposed to be in that mail parcel, but wasn't. That it? Right. Santini's crowd shot down Dan Thunden's plane when it arrived and killed the pilot. Since then, they've been trying to catch Thunden to make him show them where the thing they're after is hidden. Santini killed the pilot? Yes, Long Tom. Why? Well, when we found the pilot, he was a skeleton. Oh. Oh, that reminds me. There is some horror on this island of which Santini and his men are in deadly terror. They wouldn't tell me what it is. There's a stretch of bare rock ahead where we heard the shot. I heard Santini and his men talk about this place. It's honeycombed underground with caves. It was here that Dan Thunden lived for more than 90 years. Santini and his gang thought the stuff, whatever it is they're searching for, was hidden here. Oh, get your super machine pistol ready, Ray. Right. Well, be careful. From Santini's talk, I think this place is a nest of traps. Dan Thunden rigged them up as a diversion when he lived here. Some pastime. Oh, come on. Step on that square of red rock to your rack. It's Thunden. That'll open the trap door. Oh, go ahead, Rennie. Stamp. Wait a minute. What are you doing? The old goat said to stamp, not stoop down and inspect it. Fry up. I'm going to get even with old white whiskers for his little tricks. Now. You're not stamping on the stove. You're too far to the side. I know what I'm doing. It don't work. Try it again, sir. Rennie. You're still too far to the side. Something's gone wrong. I can't get it open. Look, Thunden, we'll get over to the other side of the place while you come and open it. Come on, over there. I don't get it. I want him by that trap door. Why? Watch. I told you to stay up. Say, he did it. A huge trap door opened. Yes, but... Look at Thunder. He's passing out. Falling down right by the trap door. My God. He looks dead. Has Dan Thunden fallen victim to the mysterious force that turns men into skeletons? Will Santini succeed in obtaining the fabulous secret of fear key? And what has happened to Doc Savage and Kel Avery trapped in the pit deep underground? Don't miss The Mysterious Weeds, Chapter 6 of Fear Key, next time on The Adventures of Doc Savage. Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Kimmet Mustin, Bill Ratner, Scott McKenna, Robin Riker, Marcia Kramer, Michael McConaughey, Douglas Kohler, and William Irwin. Also heard were Glenn Shaddix and Bob Lyons. 
Sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King. Adventures of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Ritter and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red collars have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Adam Patch presents... Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has a special. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. Such things as dark, forbidding swamps, stretching for hundreds of miles and inhabited by snakes, mosquitoes, and alligators, as in the story I want to tell you tonight. The story I call Death in the Everglades. My story begins in the vast shadowy wake of the Florida Everglades. A small dugout slides through the dark swamp water, pulled along by a weather-beaten guide. The guide's passengers, Gerald Drake and his wife Kitty, sit nervously in the center of the dugout, subdued by their strange and uncanny surroundings. You know how much further do we have to go? It's been two hours now since we left the mainland. I'll see. Guys, how much further is it to my uncle's home? It ain't much further. Just a small piece. Gerald, are you sure your Uncle Jason has money? Well, up until my mother died a year ago, Uncle Jason was sending her $500 a month. 
And he owns thousands of acres of valuable Florida property. If he has money, why should he choose to live here all alone in these horrible swamps? Because he's an eccentric. Oh, Daryl, please, let's turn back. This horrible dark swamp with its alligators and snakes frightens me. I have a feeling that something dreadful will happen if we don't turn back. Don't be a fool, Kitty. We can't turn back. We're broke, do you understand that? Uncle Jason is our last hope. We must go on. <laughs> Why have you come here, Gerald? Well, after all, Uncle Jason, I am your only living relative, and, well, I wanted to find out how you were getting along. Gerald, why is about your living here alone in the swamp? Oh, I'll yeah. always live here in the swamp. Always. Quiet and peaceful here. I have my friends. Your, your friends? Yes. Didn't you see them as you came here? Singing in the trees, swimming in the water. I know them all. They're my friends. They protect me from harm like true friends do. Yes, yes, of course, Uncle. I, I just... I want... know why you come here. You want money. That's why you come here, isn't it? Well, uh, yes. You, you see, Uncle Jason, we... we... Get out. Get out, you hear? I won't give you a cent. Not a cent. But, Uncle Jason, after all, you must remember that I'm your only... Leave my house at once. Get out. Oh, the guide won't be back until four o'clock this afternoon to take us to the mainland. Yeah. Hey, well then, I stay here until he comes. I'm going out now, and when I come back at sundown, I don't want to find either of you here. Well, what are you doing? Oh, shut up. Trying to break the lock in this metal cash box. Cash box? Yes, my darling. I sure talked with Uncle Jason convinced me that he kept his money someplace in this house. Wasn't too difficult to find his cash oh, box. Oh. If my dear uncle won't part with his money willingly, he's going to have to part with it unwillingly. Hey, cash box! What are you doing with it? Oh, okay. You're uh, home a bit early, Aunt Uncle Jason. You're trying to rob me. You're like all the others. Then well, I won't let you rob me. Give me my box. Give me my. I don't like the truth, Uncle Jason, but I must have that money. Understand? Come on now. Kill me. Kill me. You'll never get away with my box. Give me that. I'm in the swamp. Help me, you don't. Exactly what I'm doing. You're the one who's never going to leave the swamp, Uncle. You're going to stay here with your friends forever. While I go back to the mainland with your money. There. Oh, you killed him. You killed him. What did the parents of this? Don't be a fool. But then when you come looking for Uncle Jason, they, they won't find that trick. What do you mean? I'm going to get rid of dear Uncle Jason. <laughs> yes. Give me a hand with this body, Kitty. We're taking Uncle Jason to his friends. Yeah. How much further do we have to carry him? This is far enough, darling. Uh, just set him down here. Here? By the water gate? Yep. Yeah. Look perfectly. Stop his legs. Yeah. That's it. There we are. Well, you are just kind of leaving here, are you? Well, of course, darling. Uncle Jason's friends will look after him. His friends? Oh, yes. We'll go over there. See him swimming his way. Alligators. Monster alligators. Oh, they're coming up out of the water. Yes, so they are. Look. All of them are crawling up Uncle Jason's body. Yes. Goodbye, Uncle Jason. <laughs> mystery will be continued in a moment. But, Dr. Weird, if, uh, if you'll come over here, I uh, have a mystery of my own. Mystery is my business, young man. All right, uh, here's the clue. The number five. Five dead men? Oh, no, I'm afraid you're wrong, Doctor. I'm talking about the famous Adam Five, the quality hat made of all fur felt. Available at the thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers all over the country for only $5. And it's far from dead. In fact, it's the liveliest number you've ever seen, mister. Why not step into an Adam hat shop and prove it to yourself? Try on your size in a famous Adam Five. Examine its snappy style, its lively color, the look of distinction. You don't have to be a master detective to see that in quality and style, an Adam is America's top hat. Now, Dr. Weird. 
And now I'll finish my story, Death in the Everglades. An hour after Uncle Jason's death, Gerald and Kitty sat on Jason's dock, waiting for the guide to arrive. While they waited, Gerald tried to break open the metal cash box, but without success. Suddenly, he heard a shout. Hello there! Sorry if I kept you folks waiting. You hop in the dugout. You're going on way back to the mainland. You get dark in a few hours. You don't want to be caught in the... What are you staring at? That box you got there. That's the box your uncle keeps his money in. I've seen him when he's giving me money for provisions. What are you doing with it? That's my business, and I don't have to explain it to you. You do if you want me to take you in my dugout of the mainland. Perhaps this will help you change your mind about that. Uh, sure. Yeah. Now, if you value your life, you'll have us on the mainland within two hours. Two hours, you understand? <laughs> Two hours are almost up. Why haven't we reached the mainland? It's already dark. Well, kid, there's a small piece beyond this island we're passing. Hey, yeah, Kitty. A few minutes, we'll be on the mainland. But, Gerald, the guide will go to the local sheriff and tell him everything. Don't you worry about the guide. I'll stay here, him. That fool. Has he gone so close to the island? Have us a growl if he doesn't want to. No, he's gone. He's not in the boat. Gone? I, you're right. He must have swung on an overhead branch as we were passing the island. Yeah. Oh, there he is. He's standing in that small clearing on the island. I'm going away to the mainland, you thief and wanderer. I'll never take you there. Oh, what will we do, Joe? Kitty, get hold of yourself. We're going to reach the mainland safely. Oh, but how can we find our way? The sun's setting. It is already darker than before. We're going to be miles from safety. Miles of these tiny winding streams. This horrible cypress tree is going together over our heads. We can't see where we're going. Stop it, Kitty. Listen to me. We're not in any danger, do you hear me? I admit that we can't get out of the swamp tonight. All we have to do is stay right here in the dugout until morning. When it's right, it's... Oh, no, we'll never hold out there. Even the guys get lost in the Everglades sometimes. Anyway, anyway, they won't let us go. They'll stop us just like you said. Who will stop us? Uncle Jason's friend. This is over. All around us. Waiting for us. Look down in the water. Hey, you mustn't say that. We're going to make it, do you hear me? We'll be rich. There's a fortune in this cash box. Shall open it for you, and then you'll see how rich we are. There's a hard lock to pay off. Hey, I can shoot it open. Kitty, the lock's broken. Kitty, look. Money. Money? Yeah. It's 50, 100, 150, 200, 210. There's only $210 in that box? Yeah, but look, look. There's a paper in the box. He'll probably tell us where the rest of the money's hidden. Come on, let's see. Ah, it's real estate, these 20,000 acres. The best value. The best value, $1,000. No, can't be. Look, your uncle was a wealthy man. He had money in land. He had $210 and 20,000 acres of worthless swap. What? <laughs> there must be more than this. There's got to be. Stand up, get and look around you. 20,000 acres of worthless swamp. It's all yours, Gerald. And we committed murder to get it. Kenny, sit down. Oh. Sit down, you heavy. You'll turn it back out over. They're laughing your that kingdom full of snakes and alligators. Why don't you ask one of your loyal subjects how to get to the mainland? Go on, Gerald. Kenny, you go. Let's bring it over. few hundred dollars and a deed to some worthless fog land. 
and then to die in such a horrible way, only a few hundred yards from safety, in the jaws of Uncle Jason's friend, the alligator. It always occurs to me that perhaps Uncle Jason buried his fortune someplace in the swamp. Uh, perhaps you'll be interested in going with me to the Everglades to search for him. Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. He is young and intelligent and highly trained. He is Eric Banfeld, shipwrecked on a long-forgotten colony world where brawn and brute strength are more valued than knowledge, physically untrained and emotionally unprepared in the barest skills of survival, he seems compelled to spend a short and very unpleasant life as a half-naked savage worked like a beast of burden on a world so sunk into barbarism that its inhabitants have no concept of the wheel. It's either that or die. His only possible chance, his only hope of becoming one with the folk is to become a singer or teller of stories. But in Eric Banfeld's case, he must be a singer of lies. Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. silent herald of life and death, success or failure, the unseen force that measures man's destiny, reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. Mr. Oakland, uh, uh, what are you doing here in the office at this time of night? Uh, I had such a headache, I didn't notice the time. What is it, by the way? It's a quarter to eight. Why are you here so late? I might well ask you the same question. Oh, I left my umbrella behind. It's raining. On my way home from visiting a friend, I decided to call in and collect it. I have my key, of course. I saw the light on in here. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Mr. Oakman, you aren't ill again, are you? No, it's just this wretched migraine. It's been with me most of the day. I keep pills in the desk here. I thought if I took some and sat quietly, it would pass. Must have fallen asleep. How stupid of me. Well, you're certainly in no condition to drive. I think I'd better call a taxi. And on the way to your home, I think you'd better tell me everything, Mr. Oakman. You can trust me, you know. No matter what trouble you're in, you can trust me. In here, Doc. Grateful you answered the call so promptly. Well, strangely enough, Inspector, I was on my way to this block of flats. I have a patient on the second floor, but uh, what seems to be the trouble? The caretaker of the block had his water overflowing from the waste pipe of this flat and used his pass key. Went into the bathroom. Oh, well, that's through this way. Mm -hmm. And this is what he found. Well, what do you say? Great heavens. A woman in the bath. Must have drowned. Oh, yes. She's dead, all right. Gold watch on her wrist says 6.30. This is... This is too dreadful. You see, I... Well, I, I know this woman, Inspector. I recognized her the moment I raised her head. She's Elaine Oakman. I knew her and her husband, Keith Oakman, quite well. Oh, what a dreadful tragedy. Poor Elaine. You knew her? Yes, I was more of a friend of her husband's, but I used to be very friendly. Any idea how she died? Well, of course, it's, it's far too early to say. I shall have to make a complete examination. It could be many things. Heart attack. Heat overcame her. It's impossible to say right away. Oh, I can obtain authority to perform a post-mortem. Does that mean that you don't consider this to be a case of accidental drowning? Who can say? <laughs> you say you knew this woman quite well. What sort of a person was she? Well, she was... Oh, 
always extremely nice to me. I, I rather lost touch with them after they decided to go and live in the country. There was a time when their marriage looked as though it was going on the rocks. They decided that a quieter life might be better for both of them. I didn't know that Elaine had returned to town. The caretaker says she'd been in the flat for about two months. Lived alone. Well, I'll uh, carry out a complete examination and... and let... oh, I wonder who that can be. Want me to find out? Uh, let's mm. close this bathroom door first. Ah, uh, this should be interesting. Good evening. Is Elaine here? Uh, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps I should introduce myself. I'm Jim Macy. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Raven. This is Inspector Kimball. Uh, how do you do? You mean? Well, I didn't quite understand. A doctor and a, and a police inspector. There's nothing wrong with Elaine, is there? Uh, I've called to take her out. She's not in trouble, is she? You'd better put those flowers down, young man, and prepare for a shock. Elaine Oakman is dead. Can't be. It isn't possible. He died earlier this evening in the bathroom. But, uh, I was speaking to her on the telephone just this afternoon. We, we made a date to go out to supper. I, I can't believe it. Well, what happened? I mean, how did she die? We're not sure. Looks as though she may have had a heart attack through taking an overhot bath. Oh, poor Elaine. She didn't say anything about feeling ill when I telephoned. She just said she was depressed. That's all. Depressed? Yes. Elaine is was always so gay and carefree. It was unusual for her to feel miserable. That's why I brought the flowers. Why I was taking her out. You knew Mrs. Oakman well? Oh, yes, all my life. We used to go to school together when we were kids. She was older than me. Treated me like a kid brother. No romantic inclinations? <laughs> Good heavens, no. Now I'm engaged to be married. A girl nearer my own age. Christine Marwood. She lives just out of town in Ashford. I see. Well, if you knew Mrs. Oakman well, then you may be able to tell us where we can get in touch with her husband. Oh, he lives in Ashford, too. Elaine parted from him nearly a year ago. I'm not sure of the address, but Keith Oakman's in the telephone book. It's an unusual name. I'm sure it's the only one in that district. Thank you. Uh, Doc, I wonder, would you mind, as you knew him, you may be able to break the news a little more gently than I can. Oh, I'll do my best. The telephone's through in the hall, isn't it? Yes. Uh, no, don't worry, I'll find it. No, Mr. Basie. Perhaps you'll be good enough to tell me some more about Mrs. Oakman. You say that she and her husband were separated. Yes. Keith Oakman's rather a studious, serious-minded man, and Elaine was always so full of fun and vitality. She said she just couldn't adapt herself to the country life that had made the marriage even more tedious. She had plenty of friends? Oh, yes. Yeah, she was very popular at all the parties. Not any one particular person. No, I mean a boyfriend. It's funny you should ask that. I've often wondered if there was another man that he might be the reason for her marriage breaking up. But she never told me about him. Oh, she wouldn't anyway. Oh, why do you say that? Well, Elaine was funny in that respect. She always treated me as one of her family. But, well, you don't tell your kid brother about your romances. I'm sure there was someone, though. Hmm. Well, we'll remember that. I can't get Keith Oakman, Inspector. Yeah. His uh, housekeeper says he left his office early this morning and hasn't returned. I got the office number and rang that too, but there was no reply. Oh, it's not surprising this late in the day. Hmm. Well, we must get in touch with him as soon as possible. Do you uh, want me any more, Inspector? I'm, I'm still feeling a bit shocked. No. No, you may go, Mr. Macy. Just leave me your address and telephone number, if you don't mind. Yes. Yes, of course. And I think we'd better get the body over to the hospital. The moment the photographers and the fingerprint boys are through, I'd like a post-mortem. It's essential that we know exactly how Elaine Oakman died. Doc, what's the news this morning? All the information you want is right here, Inspector. The tests show that the samples of blood from both sides of the heart do not have the same salt content. What does that mean? It means that the woman died by taking in fresh water, which diluted the salt content on the left side. In other words, death by drowning in fresh water. Uh -huh. Yes. So it points to accidental death. Looks like it. You sound disappointed. I wouldn't say that, but I've got a hunch about this case. No other marks on the body? No, we're doing toxic tests on the blood, mm. but the blood specimen needs to stand in picric acid for some hours before I can report. I see. Look, Doc, can you withhold all information for a while? 
I have a special reason for asking this. Mm -hmm. If I report accidental death at this stage, they'll take me off the case. And I'm not satisfied. The moment I saw the body, I had a sure feeling that we were dealing with a murder. Uh, just a hunch or something made you suspicious? No, several things. Now, so many conflicting prints, you'd think it was a help-yourself supermarket. Elaine Oakman had a lot of callers. There was also this. I found it in the rubbish bin in the kitchen. Here, read it. Small card. Can't we forgive and forget as from tonight, K? Looks as though it came with some flowers. It was in a cellophane bag with a few cut stalks and leaves. I checked. A bouquet arrived just after five yesterday afternoon. Hmm. Typewritten and signed with a K. Do you think he could be... Her husband, Keith? May well be. You traced him? Yes. Seems he hasn't been well lately. Herbie's secretary. She seems a sensible, efficient woman. I'm going back to my office. She says she'll come round and tell me everything she can about last evening. Sounds promising. I'd right, come along. I have an idea we'll learn quite a lot. I'm afraid that's all I can tell you, Inspector. I do hope that it's of some help to you. You're telling me that your boss, Keith Oakman, asked you to stay late at his office last night. That he then suffered a reoccurrence of his migraine attacks. You gave him his usual pills, which had a soporific effect. And stayed in the office until he had slept and recovered sufficiently for you to hire a taxi and take him to your home. Yes, that's correct. You see, Mr. Oakman suffers dreadfully with this complaint. When it strikes him, he can't do a thing. He must lie in a darkened room. I took him to my flat and left him while I got his car from the garage and parked it ready for him to drive home. Oh. And what time was that? Oh, just, just before midnight. Uh, excuse me, but when I telephoned the office sometime earlier, there was no reply. Oh, I didn't answer the phone. I didn't want anyone to know. I certainly didn't wish it to be known that... Well, that I'd insisted he rested at my home. I mean, it's embarrassing, but you know what I mean. Mm, the main thing is that you were with Keith Oakman at 6.30 last night. Yes. Yes, that's right. I was. Are you quite sure of this, Miss Harris? You didn't perhaps go out of the office, leave it at all, and come back later? No, no, Doctor. I remember thinking that it didn't matter too much about working late because it was raining and I had no umbrella. There was no way that Mr. Oakman could have left his office and returned without your knowing. No way at all, Inspector. I don't quite understand these questions. Why is the time lecture so important? You've asked me about my employer's physical condition, and I've told you all I can. What has all this got to do with Mr. Oakman? Mrs. Elaine Oakman, Mr. Oakman's estranged wife, died last night. You know that, don't you? I read about it in the papers this morning. She had an accident, apparently. Isn't that true? Supposing I told you... <laughs> no. Supposing I told you that the doctor's post-mortem revealed that Elaine Oakman was murdered... Surely that isn't possible. I mean, the report in the paper. If it was as simple as all that, I shouldn't be here questioning you, should I? I repeat, Miss Harris, supposing it is murder. Well, supposing it is. You don't seem surprised. I read the newspaper, Inspector. Elaine Oakman is dead. And frankly, an accident or not, I would still feel the same way. And what's that? I should still feel intense relief. Keith had a bitterly unhappy life with that dreadful woman. Oh, if she was killed, then I have only admiration for whoever did the deed. Elaine Oakman deserved it. I repeat, she deserved to die. of your investigations, you will find that Elaine Oakman was a dreadful woman. You will certainly find plenty of suspects. Elaine was extremely popular with a certain type of man. Uh, Miss Harris, that is quite an accusation. Are you sure of your facts? You profess to have known these two people, Dr. Raven. Surely if this is so, you must agree with me. Their marriage was a disaster, and it was solely because Elaine Oakman couldn't keep her hands off other men. There, is that frank enough for you? Well, I've told you all I can, Inspector. May I go now? Uh, yes. Yes, of course, Miss Harrison. Thank you for your cooperation. Oh, before you go, one small matter. You recognize this? What is it? Let me see. Oh, a cigarette case. No. No, I'm afraid I don't. Sorry. It's all right. 
Thank you, Miss Harris, for your help. Good day. Good morning, Inspector. Well, I suppose we must have learned something from that. What do you think, Doc? I'd say it was the classic case of a woman in love with her boss. Mm, yes, I think you're right there. And what's your opinion of her condemnation of Elaine Oakman? Well, now, that's difficult for me to say. I, I can't say what sort of life Elaine was living in the city. Although I do admit that in the old days she had the reputation of a uh, good time girl. Why, she even set her cap at me at one stage. Oh, did she? Yes. Uh, of course, I treated it as a joke. Could never be anything else. Uh, but, Inspector, what was that case you handed to Anne Harris, that fresh piece of evidence? Yeah, it was nothing of the kind. Just my own cigarette case. Useful for taking fingerprints. I say, you... You mean that, that you think... You that... can never tell, can you, Doc? If Miss Harris is that keen on her boss, then one doesn't know to what lengths she'll go to protect him. She may even have helped him to do a murder. You really believe that? I don't believe anything. I'm trying to find out facts. Look... I'd like to talk to Keith Oakman next, but this youngster, Jim Macy, and his girlfriend, Christine Larwood, are waiting outside. Would you mind talking to them? No, 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 of course not, but uh, what do you want me to say? You just appear to be entertaining them, filling in the time for me. But keep a watch on the conversation. They may unbend more in your company than mine. What I really want to discover is if at any time there was a quarrel between Elaine Oakman and her husband. Now, this fellow, Jim Macy, may have certain knowledge. If you could question him and try and find out... Very distressing, but I, I'm sure after a while it will be proved to be just another unfortunate accident. Oh, I'm so glad, Doctor. I was really very shocked. I thought I'd better report back to the inspector that Christine insisted upon coming with me. Oh, of course I did. It's been a dreadful time for Jim. So horrible to think of that poor woman dying in the way she did. Horrible. Oh, easy, darling. You didn't know Elaine then, Miss Larwood? No. No, we'd never met. Jim had told me all about her, of course. She'd been very good to him over the years. She was a good friend. Many people were critical of her free and easy life. Well, perhaps she was a bit bohemian, but as far as I'm concerned, she was always generous and warm-hearted. I'm very sad. Yes, I can well believe that. You must have thought a great deal to have called on her when you knew she was feeling low. Brought flowers for her, too. And sent me home early. Oh, did he do that? <laughs> yes. Pushed me on the 6.30 train with his arms filled with carnations to take to some other woman. Oh, darling, don't put it like that. You knew why I was doing it. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> the doctor knows I'm only teasing you. Of course. Uh, will you excuse me now? I, I think the inspector will be awaiting the full details of the post-mortem. I'd better go to him. Oh, then you can tell us, doctor. Did Mrs. Oakman die a natural death? As far as I'm concerned, Miss Larwood, a perfectly natural one. Now, if you... Please excuse me, I must see Mr. Oakman, too. Well, Keith, it's a very long time since we met. Yes, yes, Ken, it is. It's quite a few years, isn't it? I'm uh, awfully sorry that it has to be under such very tragic circumstances. I can't tell you how shocked I was to be called into the case and find it was Elaine. Yes, I can't tell you what this has done to me. I've been trying to explain to the inspector. I, I still can't believe uh, it. Take a chair, Doc, and relax. How'd things go outside? Oh, very well. Everything quite correct. I thought it would be. Uh, now, Mr. Oakman, I'd like you to tell me about your movements yesterday as clearly as you can recall. Well, I'm afraid my recollections aren't that good, Inspector. Dr. Raven will confirm that I've always had these wretched migraine headaches. They started years back when he knew us quite well. Well, that's true. I've, I've often prescribed for you. I still use the same stuff. Well... Yesterday afternoon, I had a particularly vicious attack. It was late in the afternoon, and I had some pills in my desk. I took some and turned out the lights. It's essential that I remain in the dark and rest. Everyone in the office went home. Everyone? Well, everyone, uh, except Miss Harris, my secretary. She came later on. She came in and found me at about 7.30. Uh, quarter to eight might have been. The migraine was passing, but my mind was still a blank. Miss Harris is used to these attacks, so she got a taxi and we went to her flat where I took another pill and remained resting quietly until she'd collected my car from the garage. Then, later, it had all cleared and I, I was feeling all right. I drove myself home. Mm. So from about five-ish until nearly midnight, you were more or less alone, suffering from migraine. And you don't remember anything happening during that time? Mm. Other callers, telephone calls, anything like that? Well, I'm afraid you don't appreciate this type of affliction, Inspector. 
The subsequent loss of memory is quite common in these cases, isn't it, Ken? Uh, I wouldn't say common, Keith, but I, I've known it occur several times in your own case. Right. I think that's all, Mr. Oakman. Oh, uh, before you go, tell me, was your wife in the habit of keeping a diary? Well, I, I really can't say, Inspector. She was a stickler for writing things down, always kept an engagement book. I know that. I wouldn't be surprised if she did, you know, keep a diary as well. Why do you ask? Nothing. Nothing. I just thought that if she did keep a diary and we could lay our hands on it, we'd probably save ourselves a great deal of interrogation time, wouldn't we? office the whole while. Why did you say I returned later? Miss Harris, Anne, my dear, I know that you meant well by urging me to support your story, but really, the police would only have found out later on. Found out what? That I had a temporary amnesia, that after taking the pills, I can't recall what I did. I think I was in the office all the time, but I can't say for sure. I may have gone out, wandered the streets, I don't know. But aren't you afraid? Well, of what? Well, the police will think that you went to call on Elaine. You were instrumental in causing her death, that you drowned her. But why would I do a thing like that? Elaine wanted a divorce. You didn't want to give her one. There could have been a scene. You, you might have lost your temper. No, no. I don't think you appreciate the position you're in. Look at it this way. The office goes home at 4.30. You remain. You pretend to have a migraine. But I did. This is what the police will say. You take a few pills from the bottle, turn out the lights. You leave for Elaine's flat, throwing away the pills in a gutter. At the flat, you let yourself in with your key. You have a key to her flat, haven't you? Yes, I do. Well, Elaine was going out. She'd run the bath water, perhaps even stepped into the bath when you arrive. As her husband, you are about the only person on such intimate terms that, well, that you could enter her bathroom without her screaming for help. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean. Mr. Oakman, Keith, you've got to face this. You're in grave danger. The way you've told the story makes the police think that you have something to hide. Have you anything to hide, Keith? Well, have you? I thought I'd better come back and explain in more detail, Inspector. My secretary made out quite a good police case against me. Mm, yes. Could have worked that way, couldn't it? But it didn't. No, of course not. What, then, you... You don't suspect me? Let's say I'm not working on those lines at the moment, shall we? Then may I ask... What you... lines I am working on? Yes. All right, I will tell you. Then, with your permission, we'll try a little experiment in your wife's flat. Um, anything you say, but please do explain. I'll try. First of all, motive. Who are the persons most likely to want to see Elaine out of the way? Well, you'd have to count me in there, I suppose. The estranged husband, the constant wrangle about a divorce. Naturally, you headed the list. There may well be plenty of people who think you did kill your wife. I firmly believe that your secretary, Miss Harris, does for one. Not that she'd let you down. In fact, I rather believe that she'd commit murder for you. You don't suspect her, surely? No, although she could have done it. But you're both so obviously trying to protect each other that it's clear you aren't lying. No. Now, the guilty person is someone who wants a perfect alibi. You see, the person who killed Elaine drowned her, then let the water out of the bath and smashed the wristlet watch at half past six. An expensive watch. Asking a lot to leave it on your wrist while taking a bath. That didn't ring true for a start. As I was saying, the murderer then turned the water taps on to give a slow flow of water. By the time the bath water was up to the overflow and causing trouble, well over half an hour had passed. At that time, at half past six, the murderer was establishing his alibi. Mm -hmm, I see. It's clever. But who was responsible? I mean, who did kill my wife? Inspector, who is the murderer?
Doc. What, what the... Ken, Dr. Raven. It, it, it isn't you. It can't be. I see you're holding the diary, too. Yes, but I didn't find it. He did. Uh, but that's young Jim Macy lying there on the floor. That's right. I thought you wouldn't get here on time, Inspector. So I hid myself behind the door until after Jim Macy entered with his own key, had rummaged about in the desk and found the diary. Then I'm afraid I had to knock him out. Heavens, one horrible moment I thought you'd killed him. Yeah, the doc was on my list of suspects, too. He had access to the flats, and being a doctor, no one questioned his comings and goings. The fact that his first name, Kenneth, began with a K, like your own, also made me suspicious. Initial K was signed on the note accompanying the first bouquet of flowers. But I think if Doc wanted to kill Elaine, he would have done so in a far simpler manner. Yes, you're right, of course. I, I didn't kill Elaine. This young man did. He was her unknown lover. He was planning to desert her and marry Christine Larwood. Elaine found out this and started making scenes. Miss Larwood comes from a very respectable, rich family. Elaine was the sort of woman who loved to make scenes. She threatened a scandal, and Macy knew the only way he could stop it was to kill her and throw the blame on you, Keith. I'm still not quite Macy there. sent her flowers. He switched cards in the rubbish bin later, insinuating that you were calling. He came in here earlier last night, forced his way into the bathroom, and killed Elaine by grabbing her by the ankles and holding her head under the water. Then, having seen Miss Larwood off on the 6.30 train... He was clever enough to turn up here with yet another bunch of flowers. Ah, nice touch. Yes, but how did you find all this out? We knew we'd have to trick him. So we spread around the story of a missing diary. We knew if he came back to search for it, he would be guilty. I see. So all this was written down in Elaine's diary after all. <laughs> oh, no. No, there is no diary. That's the doc's petty cash book. We planted it here earlier. Just a hunch. But unlike the petty cash, I think it balances out. Don't you, doc? The makers of Bayer Aspirin, Insto Eye Drops and Philips Tablets invite you to join them again next Tuesday night at 7.30 as the moment of destiny approaches in the 11th hour. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Fresh Roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Upset with today's headlines? Worried about the high cost of living? Want to get away from it all? CBS offers you Escape. You are the friend of a man living in death, confidant of a ghoul witness to a nameless terror. You are a guest in the House of Usher. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. <laughs> Tonight, we escape to a gloom-shrouded moor and a house where dread holds sway. As Edgar Allan Poe recounts it in his famous story, 
the fall of the House of Usher. It is with some regret, but I believe advisable that I identify myself only as a friend of Roderick Usher. Certainly the last and perhaps the only friend of that unhappy man. Having only one sister, he was the last male descendant of the ancient house of Usher. Roderick had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed now since our last meeting. And so as I held his letter in my hand, not yet opening it, I reflected with no little sadness upon the devious fates that chart our courses and drive old friends away from one another. But then a sudden feverish and nostalgic curiosity laid hold of me, and with fingers made clumsy by their eagerness, I tore open the letter and read, My dear friend, my need of you has so far outgrown my pride that I'm going to request a favor which I realize full well may involve considerable inconvenience to yourself. For some time past, I have been suffering from an acute bodily illness, illness intensified by serious mental oppression, if I may so call it. A horror which looms over me, a horror grown so great I dare no longer face it alone. And so, in all humility, and for the sake of years gone by, I beseech you to come to me at once here to the family estate in the north. Should events conspire to prevent your coming, then only God may know the consequences. Your friend in desperation, Roderick Usher. And so it happened that at the end of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the middle of October, I found myself as the shades of evening drew on within view of the grim and melancholy House of Usher. I confess that the first sight of the house, the fungus-covered walls of stone thrusting their crumbling ramparts against the darkening sky, rising out of the sullen, sluggish waters of the black tarn at their base, the bleak and vacant windows staring blindly, the bone-white trunks of decaying trees. These things filled me with a nameless and desolate terror, so that I reined in my horse and sat trembling, half fearing to cross the wooden bridge that led over the waters of the moat and up to the entrance of the House of Usher. Then impatiently I shook off this strange feeling of dread, and was an instant later clattering over the wooden bridge and onto the courtyard. I dismounted quickly, tossed my reins to the silent lackey who approached, strode across the gravel and up to the massive wooden portal, the door of the House of Usher. Good afternoon. My name I is... I know. You're the friend of Master Roderick. Please come inside, sir. Thank you. But may I inquire how it happens you know me? You have been expected for some time, sir. Yes, true. But also I'm a stranger to you and could be some other visitor. That you could be anyone other than the friend whom Master Roderick expects, sir, would be impossible. You see, no one else would ever come to this house. Then I followed his stealthy footsteps through many dark and intricate passages. My earlier foreboding heightened and was made fearful by the somber aspect of the hallways by which we passed. The many unused rooms reaching out with their vast emptiness like some hideous jungle creeper. But at length, we stood before the door of the master's studio and there the servant left me, departed and left me to go in alone. The man across the room, half reclining on the couch, his back turned toward me, 
did not hear the opening of the door. For the space of several heartbeats, I saw only the deathly pale and ghastly sunken features of a stranger. Then only with difficulty could I recognize, behind that mask, my boyhood friend. For surely, under light of heaven, no man had ever before so terribly altered in so brief a time as said Roderick Usher. Oh. Oh, my friend, my friend, you come at last. Thank God you did come. Oh, Roderick, did you not know I would? Could you not be sure that no long years would ever dim the friendship we shared in youth? Mm, so many things have dimmed. Ah, youth, it seems so long ago. But now you're here, and we'll find it, relive it all over again, every glorious moment of it. And all these shadows, all these gibbering phantoms that haunt me, they'll be driven out. And then the sun will shine again, and we'll be young again and relive... Roderick! Oh, oh, but forgive me, my friend. My excessive joy at the sight of you after so many years drives me into a frenzy of talk. How many years has it... Oh, no matter. It is enough that you are here, here, and brought with you all the lost, all the happy days of my boyhood. But uh, I'd expected from your letter to find you in serious straits indeed. Instead, you seem in the best of spirits. You have the right to know. But in all frankness, here in your presence, I find it difficult to credit important to those things which only yesterday filled me with terror. True, I've been ill. A nervous affliction, something in the nature of a family weakness, probably. It has affected me with a morbid acuteness of the senses, such that quite often the least sounds and odors and colors become irritating beyond endurance. Then I've eaten but little, as you can see. But surely you've retained the services of a physician. A physician? <laughs> oh, yes, of course. He calls almost daily, though it is more often Madeline that he attends. You remember my twin sister, Madeline? For her, I fear, more greatly than for myself. Even today, she's taken to her bed, and I have no doubt will never rise from it again. Oh, a tragedy. The sympathies of my heart go out to you. Oh, but... But leave it for the present. Leave it to dream of all those happy days we left so far behind. Everything will be different now that you're here. Do you remember when we were well? But the happy forgetfulness which Roderick found in my coming was short-lived. And in a few days, he had sunk into a morose torpor from which only occasionally with frantic difficulty could he reach the joy of our first few hours of meeting. More often, his mental apathy was broken by bursts of vicious temper and violent ill humor. Fits I could only excuse on the basis of his illness. And that illness began in my mind to assume a most mysterious character. Being unable to divine its true nature from Roderick's hesitant offerings, I took the liberty of questioning the physician a few days later when I chanced to encounter him in a hallway. Yes, yes, she's resting as well as might be expected. But she continues to decline. Is that not correct, Doctor? That would seem to be the case. And uh, the malady, the illness which has stricken her, is it the same as that which affects her brother, Roderick? I may venture that it is. Might I inquire the nature of this illness? As to that, I am unable to say. You imply, then, that I have no right to the information? Not at all. I am confessing to you quite simply, sir. I do not know what afflicts Madeline and Roderick Usher. And so a week passed. A week in which the sullen, leaden skies darkened into deeper oppressiveness in which Roderick's deathly pallor and creeping mental dissolution grew more apparent. A week in which the monstrous atmosphere of this ancient mausoleum began to crawl insidiously within my own consciousness, stirring into life a formless, unknown dread. 
Then one evening, we were sitting in the vaulted studio, while the first shadows of night began to flow together into pools of darkness. Roderick had been unusually troubled during the day and had been trying to find some solace by playing on the violin. Of a sudden, there came a knock upon the door. Stop it! Stop that infernal pounding! Do you hear? Do you wish to drive me completely mad? Open the door and come in, come in! It's the doctor. Well, what is it? What do you want? Master Usher, I regret that I must say this, but it is my sad duty to inform you that your sister Madeline is no longer living. Madeline? My sister? Then she's dead? She breathes no more. Dead? <laughs> and perhaps, my dear doctor, you can tell me what caused her death. Unfortunately, I can only take refuge in the term heart failure. Heart failure? <laughs> ah, yes, eh? <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, very well, doctor. If you'll be kind enough to wait, I'll come down directly and discuss the arrangement. At your service. I bid you good afternoon, gentlemen. Roderick, I assure you of my deepest sympathy. You do. Your deepest sympathy. The doctor regrets his sad duty. Are you fools, both of you fools? I, I don't understand. Haven't you seen it yet? Can you not feel it about you? The horrid, monstrous, brooding spirit of this accursed house. Can't you hear its evil laughter as it lurks in the hallways and grows fat upon the soul? My dead sister. Roderick. Can't you see that it matters nothing to me that she's dead? That I myself walk but a few steps behind her into the same shadows of hell? Can't you sense those hideous tentacles even now reaching out for me? For me, who now the last living, if it be living, the last living descendant of the accursed house of Ash. <laughs> Such was the passing of Madeline Usher, once living, now dead. And her very death, untimely in its aspects, bore to my trembling soul a portent of events yet more hideous, more horrible, and yet to come. At a later hour of that same sad night, Roderick came into my chamber to voice an intention so morbidly unnatural that for the moment I could only feel that his tottering reason had at last failed him entirely. Then you refuse? But, but Roderick, this is madness. I tell you, before this night is over, the coffin body of my sister shall rest in the vault beneath this house, and if you will not help me, I shall do it myself. But... Why? Why? I could not stand to think of her buried out there in the dark graveyard, alone among the dead. Roderick, she too is dead. It's fantastic how little we know of death or of life. The doctor says she no longer breathes. She is dead. She was so lovely, was my sister. Roderick. I must keep Madeline near me. Nothing but evil would come of such an act. I can trust no one but you. Not even the physician himself. He hates us because he can't discover what it is that kills us. Even he might steal the body of my beloved sister. And he might learn our secret. You understand, don't you, my friend? Yes, Roderick. Yes. I understand. (laughs) 
And so it came about. Near midnight, we two alone made our way to an upper chamber of the house. And taking up the black coffin between us in the shuddering light of candles, we walked the tortuous passageways, slowly descended the curving stairs of stone, passed beneath the moldy level of the earth, forced open a massive and age-rusted door of iron and stood at last with our ghastly burden in a subterranean dank and musty crypt underneath the house of Usher. Over here, my friend, on these trestles. Now, a trifle higher with the head. <coughs> there. Oh, may you sleep in peace and dream, sweet sister, from I who tread the same path soft behind you. Come, Roderick. The thing is done. Oh, wait. Stay a moment. We've not yet affixed the coffin lid. See? I've left it loose so it can be turned back. No, I beg you. A last farewell, no more. Look, is she not beautiful? Yes, she was very beautiful. Was? <laughs> yes, of course. The look of her confused me. But do you not see it too? The warm glow of the cheeks, the eyes shut softly, those lips half parted. Does it not seem that she may rise up and speak to us at any moment? This gruesome place inspires those morbid fancies. Morbid fancies? That now dead she seems to live and living seems already dead? Man, you seek out madness. You caught it with your very thoughts. And if I do, what matters? What value can there be in reason without the hope of life? Dead, you say to me, she is dead. Upon what certainty? Why not with equal reason say instead she lives? And that I, I the last of Asha, am the one who is already dead. <laughs> I prevailed upon my friend at last to leave that mournful place. And so with grim finality we secured the ebon lid, took up our flickering candles and departed from the crypt, leaving it alone with its darkness and death. The ponderous portal closed behind us. And then my soul for one brief instant felt the dread and awful meaning of eternity. <laughs> There followed then a week of such dreary gloom and melancholy that my own spirit quavered at the menace of the nameless thing and shadowed in that house. By perceptible degrees, the living soul of Roderick Usher flickered lower. More ghastly grew his pallor, more tremulous the extremity of his terror. <laughs> eighth day following the death of Lady Madeline fell upon the last day of grim and gray October and brought with it as the curtains of night descended the fitful breath of a rising tempest, uneasy gusts of sodden rain, and the sound of sullen thunderous rumbles born of the dim flares of sheet lightning somewhere behind the lowering pall. I retired at a late hour but found sleep impossible. At length overpowered by some strange presentiment of evil, I found my reposeful inaction no longer endurable. And so I arose, threw on my clothes in haste, and fell to pacing the floor of my darkened chamber. Then in one instant, a soft sound in the blackness froze my steps in paralysis of terror. The latch of my chamber door was being lifted from without. Oh, was it? What is it, I say? It is I, Roderick. Oh. Oh, Roderick. What are you doing up and about at this hour, in pitch blackness? Wait, let me light the candles. No, I am quite used to darkness. I heard your footsteps and knew that you must be awake, even as I was. But 
Can it be that you've not seen it? I don't understand you. I've seen nothing. Then stay. You shall see it. Even as I've seen it for these past two hours. Wait, wait. I'll throw open the casement window. There. Look! It was indeed a tempestuous yet sternly beautiful night. And one wildly singular in its terror and in its beauty. The exceeding density of the clouds which hung so low as to press upon the turrets of the house did not prevent our perceiving the velocity with which they flew careening from all points against one another. We had no glimpse of the moon or stars, but terrible to behold, the undersurfaces of the huge cloud masses as well as all terrestrial objects immediately around us were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and clearly visible phosphorescence which hung like a shroud about the mansion itself. You see, my friend, tonight the thing grows bolder, gathers strength from the storm and from the dead soul it's eaten. No, no, Roderick, you must not look at this. Here, I shall close this window and pull these curtains. And now, candlelight. Such darkness is the very mother of evil fear. There. Now come, sit here. Suppose I read aloud from some book or another. As you wish. I presume it matters little which. Oh, here. Here is a volume of The Mad Tryst by Canning. Will it serve? As you said, it matters little. I've always found the scene to be quite entertaining, where an Ethelred dreams of fighting a dragon. Now, let's see. Oh, yes. Here it is. And so, Ethelred waited no longer to hold parley with the hermit who mocked him from inside the hut. But feeling the rain upon his back and fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his axe and quickly made a hole in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand. And now, pulling sturdily, he so cracked and ripped all asunder that the noise of the dry and hollow sounding wood alarmed and reverberated through out the forest. Why do you stop? Why, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's strange. I, I fancied I just heard the very sound I read about. Let us say it was caused by the storm, pray continue. Oh, yes, the storm. Of course. <clears throat> but, but Ethelred, upon entering the door, was was amazed to perceive no sign of the evil hermit, but instead a dragon of prodigious and scaly demeanor which sat on guard before a shield of shining brass. And Ethelred uplifted his axe and struck the head of the dragon, which fell before him with a shriek so horrid and harsh, like whereof was never before. What? What sound is that? Sound? The shriek of a dragon, my friend, read on. I, uh, I... Very well. And now the champion, bethinking himself of the shield of brass, approached across the silver floor to where the shield hung upon the wall. But the shield, not waiting for his coming, loosed and fell upon the silver floor with a mighty great... And, Roderick, I tell you something moves within this house... Uh, that sound, it reverberated through the very walls. Can you tell me now you did not hear it? Hear it now? Oh, yes, I hear it and have heard it long moments, hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not speak. But why? Do you not know we put her living in the tomb? I tell you now, I heard her first feeble movements in the coffin many, many days ago. And I felt then it mattered little. But now she comes to upbraid me for my haste. And that last dread sound. Yes, I heard it. The opening of the metal door to the crypt beneath the house. Now she comes here. Have I not heard her footsteps on the stair? Do I not distinguish the heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman that I am, I tell you that she now stands without that door. But even now she opens it. 
there in the flickering light of candles, in the gloom and curtained doorway stood the shrouded body of Lady Madeline. For one shuddering instant she swayed there, then as Roderick uttered a single piteous cry, she fell upon him in violent and now final death agonies and bore him to the floor, a corpse. From that chamber and from that mansion, I fled aghast out the massive portal over the causeway into the night. Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light, and I looked back in heightened terror. For the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The baleful gleam came from the setting full and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through a widening crack in the walls of the house itself. And even as I gazed, its vision opened rapidly. There came a fierce breath of the tempest. The entire lunar orb burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There came a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of thousand waters. And, and the dark, deep tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently forever over the pitiful ruins of the ancient house of Usher. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight brought you The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with Paul Fries as the narrator, Ramsey Hill as Roderick Usher, and Sheridan Hall as the physician. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhrer. Next week... You are the victim of a poor man... Pursued from the west coast of Africa to the west end of London by a dead man's head, which grins at you upside down. Next week, Escape with H.G. Wells' gripping story, Pollock and the Poorer Man. Good night, then, until this same time next week when CBS again offers you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. The program you are about to hear is largely fiction, science fiction. We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. Exploring tomorrow. (laughs) 
And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr. The philosophers down the ages have hassled a long time and with many words about the good, the true, and the beautiful. The true, uh, well, that can be defined pretty objectively. But there's a peculiar thing about beautiful. What is beauty? And uh, in whose terms? Makes it difficult. With the story of The Adventure of the Beauty Queen, which stars Miss Charlotte Sheffield, Miss United States of 1958. <laughs> Beauty is a much more complicated problem than the question of truth, actually. A truth is an eternal thing. If it's true, it's true, and that's that. But beauty, beauty is appropriate. It changes as the situations change. It changes with time. I wonder how our own concepts of beauty, that is, our human race's concepts of beauty, will change as time goes by. Uh, let's suppose that a famous young woman of our time, Miss United States, if you like, is awakened in her sleep by an alien presence, a strange force she feels but cannot see. It's something she knows is there. Who are you? Yes. Can you see me? No. Nor can I see you. But I am conscious I am with you. True, yes, of course. No. No, it's real. Who are you? A man who in your terms belongs to the distant future. I am unborn in the way you think of it. And to me, you have been dead over a thousand years. Were I back in my own orbit. Someone's playing a joke. No. This is no joke. But please, don't be afraid. I mean no harm. I've been dead a thousand years. Wherever you are, what are you talking about? Listen to me. Try to understand. I belong to a race of scientists. In simple words, you can understand. We have a device which enables us to project ourselves into the past. You belong to the past. Do you understand? Yes device has made me conscious of you for a long time. I have used it to explore the past, and in these explorations, I have searched for the highest form of human beauty. How do you know whether or not I'm beautiful if you can't see me? The device tells me you're beautiful. Beauty, real beauty, is a force that transmits itself, that can be picked up by a form of radar. Please understand, I am only using terms I think you can follow. In my own orbit, I would not even talk to a child in such simple terms. Go away. Please go away. I can't. I'm in love with you. What? In love with you. In love? Yes. Oh. Very much. <laughs> is it funny? Oh, yes. I don't think it is. But it is. Do women of your time always laugh at a man's love? Oh, don't be silly. I wasn't laughing at you. Well, then at what? I just thought it was very funny. The idea of your being in love with a blip on a radar screen. After all, that's about what I am to you, isn't it? Oh, no. It must be. No, no. The, the radar screen, as you call it, simply picked you up, pointed you out to us. Us? Uh, my associates and I. Oh. I, I felt very strongly drawn to you. I convinced my associates to conduct further experiments. Actual contact with someone out of the past. You. I had to know you. I had to come into orbit with you. Look, don't you think this joke has gone far enough? Well, I told you this is not a joke. Of course it is. Well, you know better. Oh, don't you suppose I know what's going on? Well, I should have thought of it a long time ago. What is going on? Why, well, it's very simple. Someone installed a radio pickup in this room. And you're talking to me through a microphone. Talking to you? You are, aren't you? Oh, no. What do you mean, no? I'm not talking to you. 
in the way you think I am. I'm projecting to you. Oh, please stop this. But it's not your voice I hear. I'm receiving impulses from you, not actual words. The device I mentioned interprets the nature of your impulses, translates them into my language. It does the same for you. It's true. I don't hear your voice. Not, not as a sound, I mean. You begin to realize. Please stop. No, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You must be insane to say that. I'm, I'm scared out of my life. I want to scream. I, I'm afraid to. I'm not even sure I'm awake. I'm not even sure I'm alive. You're alive. In your century. Now, understand what I'm telling you. In a moment, you'll be drawn out of your orbit, projected into the future, into my orbit. I want to see you. I want to see if you're as beautiful as your impulses say you are. If you are, I'm afraid I'll keep you where I am in the future. <laughs> no, I don't believe any of it. You're mad. Whoever you are, you're quite insane. <laughs> are you receiving? Yes. Don't be afraid. You're in limbo. On your way into my orbit. Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. All of us, as American citizens, believe in our inherent liberties and freedoms, such as the freedom of the individual to choose and elect his own national representatives. It has been said that there is only one ruling class in America, the people themselves who, through their vote, have established the law of our land. The real importance of this freedom depends on our accepting the responsibility not only to know what we are voting for or against, but also to choose our leaders for the best interests of the nation. So, accept your responsibility and ensure your freedom. Of all things men have discussed and considered today, time is the one of which we know least. We know how to travel in space, and recent physical work has indicated that uh, actually things can travel backwards as well as forwards in time, but we know nothing about it. And one of the things that would be strange on this, how long does it take to travel through time? When you are traveling through time itself, how long does it take to go from now to then? How long was Miss United States in that limbo before she was there? I'm talking to you. I'm projecting to you. Are you receiving me? Are you afraid? A little. Not as much as you thought you'd be. No. Have you any idea of where you are? I'm in a room. That's all I know. I'm in the next one. We're on the 500th floor of the Institute of Technical Research in the city of Columbia. In your century, I believe you called it Washington. Washington? You understand, this is America. I'm glad to hear that. That place. Yes, I can see it relieves you. You can see me? Very clearly. And am I? Are you what? Well, what you expected me to be. To some extent. Do you find me unattractive? Alien. Alien? Uh, different. Yes, I know the meaning of the word. At first, I was conscious of a sense of, of shock. When I first saw you. At least you're frank. Well, I'm a scientist. Do you find me ugly? I said alien. 
Of course, I knew you would be. I didn't expect you to measure up physically to our standards. The human form has improved a great deal since your century. But why? Was there a reason? Man-made reasons. Can you tell me? Well, it began with interplanetary wars conducted by the nations of the world. The struggle to build empires in outer space on other planets. When was this? Oh, not in your century. You saw only the first feeble attempts to explore space. Yes, I suppose our attempts are feeble. Well, the interplanetary wars did a great deal of destruction, particularly on this planet. Precious documents, books, records were lost. But there was another result. The atmosphere of the Earth became charged with radioactive matter. For a while, it looked as though the human race had become extinct, but it didn't. The human body acclimated itself to new atmospheric conditions and flourished again. But by that time, our physical form had changed. It changed for the better. And today... Go on. Well, today, the human form is the most beautiful creation has ever seen. And by your standards, I am something of a shock to you. Your physical form was, at first, yes. Am I very different from the women here? Very different. To you, they're beautiful. They are beautiful. Would I find them attractive? I don't think so. I might. Oh, no. Why not? If they're so beautiful, I mean. Well, your conception of beauty is not ours. I understand that, but... But what? Uh, oh, I don't know. I was going to say that beauty is beauty. But that wouldn't make any sense. No, the concept of beauty is what matters. But you said beauty is a force. It radiates. The inner beauty radiates. I I understand that, too. Well, how do you think of the universe? Oh, I think I associate it with God. I identify it with the divine mind. I'm surprised. The universe is a reflection of God. Now I begin to understand why, in spite of your physical form, your beauty reached me. And it has nothing to do with your looks. I... I wouldn't be very gracious if I... if I didn't say thank you. I'm going to keep you here, you know, if I can. I don't think you quite mean that. I mean it in every sense. I want you now to... But to remember what I've said about the change for the better in human form. I'm going to open the door to your room and come in. Now, now, please keep in mind that I do not look as the men of your century looked. But also remember that here I'm, well, I'm supposed to be a reasonably good-looking fellow. I... I would like to see you. Well, you will. In the next few seconds. That which is beautiful and befitting, appropriate, depends on the environment it's in. The future people had had to undergo some rather complete changes to meet the environment that, uh, shall we say, we, their ancestors, had imposed on them. A little too much radioactivity. And that which was beautiful is no longer befitting. The thing that is now befitting we might not think of as particularly beautiful. Is it so bad? I'm sorry. I... I I should not have exposed myself to the shock you feel, to the revulsion you feel at the sight of me. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I should have known. I, forgive me. I, I just can't look at you for a moment. I have to... I have to adjust. There's a window behind you. You can look out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Please, don't resent me. No, I, I... I was just wondering if you have any idea how incredible to me your revulsion is. Yes, I think I have an idea. Uh, you must overlook what sounds like vanity, but I have to repeat what I told you before. I, I'm supposed to be more than passably good-looking. Yes, I understand. But you can't stand the sight of me. Give me a moment. Are you looking at me? Yes. Does it still hurt you? No. No, I'm too conscious of your inner beauty. I'm very grateful. I'm curious about something. Yes? Are you conscious of any of my 
impulses? I think so. Do you find them hostile? No. Alien? No. Do they cause you any fear? I don't think so. Well, forgetting how I appear to your eyes, do you like me? Y- yes. Yes, I think you must be a very nice person. The curious thing is... Yes? Well, I was going to say, the curious thing is I'm... I'm still in love with you. You mustn't be. <laughs> Perhaps love is a dimension. I don't know. I... Oh, I'm too confused to think about it. Or perhaps it's an orbit we enter or leave. (laughs) I don't know either. It was just a thought. You can't examine love through a microscope, can you? Well, it's been exposed to every kind of study for centuries. Even the people of your time knew its reactions to be purely chemical. Of course, your poets didn't agree, but then neither do ours. Do you have poets? Oh, yes, we have them. They resist us. They call themselves the last human barrier against science. They refuse to understand what basic science is. What is it? Well, isn't it man's eternal craving to find out more about the universe, the divine mind? Let me go back. Go back? Please. How can you even want to go back? Look, what do you see through that window? Nothing but beauty. Miles of emerald green fields with cities that sparkle like diamonds rising out of them. Nothing but prosperity. Prosperity and peace. And you want to go back to your miserable century? To my people. To my own people. I belong with them. I don't belong here. I'll tell you something. We're being observed, listened to by my associates. Observed? Well, the final decision must come from them. I'm I'm as much a part of this experiment as you are, even though it was my idea. My idea. My idea. My idea. Now that we've succeeded in drawing you out of your orbit into ours, I... I don't think our science will release you. We can learn a great deal from you about the things of your century. Besides, I love you. I I want to keep you here. Please! Please don't touch me! Please don't touch me! Dream. That's all it was. That's all it was. It couldn't have been anything else. It couldn't have been. There are parts of beauty that are eternal that are not not like the physical that changes but the beauty of a true and honest personality this sort of beauty that will endure there are things that you can rely on as time goes by woman needs man a man must have his mate on this you can rely the only thing is The definition of man and woman will tend to change with the passing of ages. But the fundamental things apply. An honest man and an honest woman. These we need forever. Join us for a fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight were Brett Morrison and the real Miss United States of 1958. Charlotte Sheffield. Script was by John Fleming. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Guy Wallace speaking. Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth 
born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. Entrado Expressivo, Introduction with Expression, the original composition of Frank Smith, on Dante, Allegretto, Ad Libitum, Tempo and Execution under the Baton of Cesar Petrillo. is the music of five after the hour. The play, Murder Has No Tongue. just committed the perfect crime. So perfect that you won't believe I did it. Even when I tell you. Even when I show you. Because it's the perfect crime. Julie. Why don't you fall back under your stone and leave my life alone? I got your little note. Your little love letter. Max, get out of here. Very sweet it was. Only you should have delivered it yourself. It's a wife's duty to inform her husband in person that she's no longer his wife. Big scene, brush off, leave him with a laugh. You know, a flash finish to a high class act. A high class. Julie Reed, the plaintiff, versus Maxie Reed, the defendant. <laughs> At that, you got top billing. What do you want, Max? You got to take me back, Julie. That's right, small time. Crawl. You got to take me back. I'm no good alone. As an actor, or anything else. <gasps> what about the big single you were going to do? You don't need me. You always said so. Without me, you'd be big time for somebody. I was wrong. Without you, I'm nobody. You were always a nobody. You were born a nobody and you'll die a nobody. You're a somebody, I suppose. I was a somebody. Before you song and danced your way into my life. I had friends. Nice friends. I, I could have been happy if I'd married somebody else. I, I could have married Claire. Yeah, I know. Your father was a doctor. And what was yours? What did he do? Who was he? Didn't even know his name. Ah, uh, cut it out. That's the life I should have had. That's the life you were going to hand me. Champagne, caviar, sables from head to toe. <laughs> you handed me champagne, all right, in a pop bottle in our act. 
You, you were going to put my name up in lights on Broadway a mile high. Julie, I will. You couldn't get us booked into the lobby of the Astor. Honest, I've changed. Oh, don't make me laugh. Julie, I've got to have you back. I'd do anything for you, Julie. I'd, I'd die for you. I'd, I'd kill for you. You killed enough for me already. You killed everything I ever was or hoped to be. You killed every chance I ever had. Killed every soft and decent thing in my life. Now go ahead and die for me. I'll make it up to you, Julie. I'll buy you everything. Oh, you never bought me a flower or a box of candy in your life. Honest, I'll get to be big time, Julie. Big time? The only thing about you that was ever big time was that you looked like somebody else who was big time. Sure, in your top hat and tails, rented, of course, you looked exactly like Cappy Vane. Maybe that's why I fell for you. The poor man's Cappy Vane. The poor man's poor man? You couldn't be the sixth carbon of a man with class like Cappy Vane. Julie, if I brought you all the things Not that you... if you brought me the world on a platter. Oh, you take the world on a platter. Not if you went with it. If I changed. Julie, if I got class. Not a chance. No one means anything to me, Julie. Nobody. You're in my blood. Keep away from me. If I could even hope to hold you in my arms to kiss you again. It wouldn't mean a thing. I don't believe that. Let go of me. I don't believe that. Let go. It doesn't mean a thing. doesn't mean a thing. You're out of my system like poison, washed away. You're dead. Maxie, you're dead. I stumbled out the door and down the stairs somehow. My hands, my face, my body burned. I gasped for breath. My lungs seemed full of smoke. I struggled toward the air as if groping through a burning house. There was a beat, 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 beat inside my head like voodoo drums. I walked and walked, keeping time with the beat. Then I heard the automobile horn screeching like a million parrots. Screeching. Dead. 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 The stoplight blinked yellow and red and became a marquee on Broadway a mile high, blinking my name, Maxie Reed. Maxie Reed, the greatest little guy that ever hit the big time. And then I heard my entrance music, and I was on. Stick, white gloves, top hat and tails, the dance, the gypsy society bit, laughs, all laughs. The big pop bottle of champagne, the bow to Julie, the kiss, the faint, the finish. She carries me off, the laugh, the applause. <laughs> Again the light. Yes, again the light. A mile high. But it wasn't blinking my name anymore. Now it said Cappy Vane. Cappy Vane. And I saw him in top hat and tails, pouring real champagne for hundreds of beautiful women. And they applauded too. And the applause was louder than mine. I'd never seen this man, this society playboy, except in the papers. In newsreels. Neither had Julie, yet I couldn't get his face and figure and voice out of my mind. So much like me and yet so different. He was class, champagne and caviar, sables and white lights. To Julie, he was life, and I was deaf. And then faces began flashing past me, so fast they blurred into each other like horses on a merry-go-round. Julie's face and mine and Cappy Payne's faster, 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 faster. And then suddenly everything stopped, and I saw only his face sharp and clear. His face. Or was it mine? I couldn't tell anymore. But at last I knew what it was I had to do. Who's who in America, sir? Or will you find it in the reference room to your left? Open shelves under W. Last edition of the Wall Street Journal. Upstairs to your right under business of tonight. <laughs> back copies of the daily papers are in the basement vaults. Uh, Mr. Grousley, will you please show this gentleman down to the vault? Yes, we make off-the-air recordings of many radio broadcasts. We record entire programs or portions thereof. 
You can play it on any one of these turntables or on a home photograph. The record is cut on acetate, you see, and can be played with good clarity quite a number of times. What particular radio program did you have in mind? Oh, well, we're just terribly proud to have you as our special guest on the Let's Have a Party program, Captain Bain. Now, what's your formula for a successful party, Captain? Well, Ilza, it's perfectly simple, really. When the guests arrive, I merely throw open the front doors, throw open the kitchen, and throw open the bar. Then I sneak into the servants' quarter, cautiously arrange myself in the dumbwaiter, haul myself to the cellar, and run out the back door. It's perfectly simple, really. Simple, really. Simple, really. Simple, really. Simple. Perfectly simple, really. Perfectly simple, really. Now I gotta try it again. Gotta try it again. Pretty simple, really. When the guests arrive, I merely throw open the front doors, throw open the ki- Perfectly simple, really. Perfectly simple, really. Perfectly simple, really. I've got it. I've got it. Tell you once and for all, Vane, this wild spending spree has got to come to an end. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Oh, confound it, Vane. Be serious for once. You're not being fair to your sister Madeline, you know. No, you're not, Kathy. According to the terms of your father's will, Madeline is to come into a half share of the fortune on her 25th birthday. But at the rate you're going, Vane, when Madeline's 25, she'll inherit a half share of nothing. Ooh. Now, I'm warning you, Vane. You'd better behave. Or... Or what? Briefly. Just this. Your mad squandering, your hair-brained antics these last years have made you a public joke. A family disgrace. The question of your sanity has become a popular subject of discussion. <laughs> As family counselor, I could easily take matters out of your hands. I've refrained up to now because of the family. But if you force my hand, I'll have you legally set aside as an incompetent. And that, briefly, is that. Come, Madeline. Good night, Cappy, darling. Sleep well. Good night, sweet sister. Too bad John or Martha aren't here to show you to the door. But I've sent them on a vacation with double pay. How nice of you. How nice of you. It's your money. You'd do well to remember what I said. I should like to have you placed in an institution... You don't turn practical. I assure you I will. And be justified in so doing. Good night, Faye. Thanks for being at home when we call. Don't worry. If I'd seen you coming, I'd have sneaked down the dumb waiter and been out the back of the river way before you could say... Who? Hmm? Talking to myself. Maybe Hamilton's right. <laughs> no, he isn't. I'm not bad. I'm very clever. Isn't the dumb waiter a clever idea? And practical. Comes in handy, doesn't it? Yes. It does. What are you doing in my study? What do you want? Who are you? What do I look like? Who do you... That's strange. You look exactly like me. I know. Incredible. As if I were looking in a mirror. Is this some practical joke? It is if you want it to be. You're famous for practical jokes. It's incredible. I agree with you. It's incredible. <laughs> Good imitation. Nobody knows you're here. Nobody saw you come in. Nobody. Yes, I can use you. Oh, what a joke I can play on Hamilton and Madeline. I can... I'm afraid the joke's on you. What you mean? I'm going to strangle you, Mr. Vane, with this tie. Well, I, I, I don't understand what you want of me, Mr. Vane. Why did you ask me to come here? At the suggestion of an old friend of yours, your former husband. Mac? 
He seemed to feel it was my fault you couldn't be happy with him. Oh, oh, oh no. Said you compared us all the time, that he couldn't live up to your expectations, that it made you very unhappy. Poor Max. I- I'm afraid he gets a little mixed up sometimes. Perhaps you should use the past tense. He may not be alive. What? He said that as long as I was alive, he was dead. In your eyes, at least. Oh. But he looked like a man who expected to end his own life very soon. Oh, no. No, not Max. You, you don't know him. He, he's a coward. Real small time. If you know what I mean. He loved you very much. And if it was my fault that he never loved him, I... Oh, I... I loved him. You did. What? Oh, but his part of my heart is closed now like... like the lid on a coffin. He said the least I could do was to make it up to you in some way. I'd like to try. May I? It would be... interesting to me. You're very kind. Thank you very much. But it's no use. And if you should ever just happen to talk to him again, tell him that I still think he's small time. Will you please? Max? Wait a minute. What did you mean by that? Max, you're out of your mind. I know you anywhere when your eyes look like that. What are you doing here? Why are you dressed like that? Why do you call yourself Mr. Vane? Come with me, Julie. Where is Mr. Vane? Mr. Vane? The well-born Mr. Vane? The Mr. Vane of the top hat and tails? The Mr. Vane of distinction, class, gentility, the champagne and caviar? The original of my carbon copy? The man you told me and told me and told me was so much better than me? Where is Mr. Vane? Oh, Mr. Vane. He must be around here somewhere, Julie. Oh, Mr. Vane. Perhaps he's here in this dumbwaiter. Look! Well, what do you think of me now? Oh, no, no, don't, 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 don't look at me like that, Julia. You don't understand. I've moved up into the big time, the real class. You're mad. Mad. No more prop champagne, Julie. No more props at all. Everything's real. I own the world and I give it to you. That body in there. Dead. He's dead. But not me. Not anymore. I'm born again. Julie, I own the world and I make you a present of it on a silver platter. I don't want it. But it's yours, Julie. Whatever I did, I did for you. You know that, don't you? Because I wanted you back. I didn't think I could do it, but you gave me strength, Julie. I found myself. I hate you. And now it's yours for the rest of your life. I can fool everybody, Julie. I've studied his walk, his talk, his looks, his family history. Oh, stay with me, Julie. Tell me that I've come alive. Oh, here it is, don't you see? Everything you ever wanted, everything you ever dreamed, all you could have been or hoped to be. I hate you. They'll never know. No one will know. Please. Listen to me, Julie. As the river runs behind the house, swift running water, water washes everything away. Help me. No. Help me, otherwise I'll have to stop your tongue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me why don't you. I can't. Coward! I love you, Julie. I'm going. To the police? You might as well. I'd rather be dead than live without you. No, ma'am. I'm not going to the police. I hope they don't find out. I hate you so much, I'd rather see you live. This new body, this new world of yours. Because I know what will happen to you. I can see it in your eyes. That twisted brain of yours will snap. And I wanted to. It's what you deserve. Life in darkness, stale in life. 
Oh, no. Keep your world. I want no part of it. It's all yours. Live in it. Forever. Here we are, Inspector. Come right in. But, Mr. Vane, you didn't have to come to my office and drag me out to your house to prove anything. I, I believe you. No, you don't. You're humoring me as if I were mad. I've told you over and over again I'm not Cappy Vane. Hello, Vane. I'm... Hello, Inspector. Hello, Hamilton. What are you two doing here? Excuse Madeline and me for barging in this way, Vane. Just got uh, here a moment ago. Came as soon as we received your call, Inspector. You know, Vane's sister, Madeline, of course. Oh, of course. Oh, Cappy, I'm so sorry. I'm not Cappy. You're not my sister. My name is Max. Your brother Cappy's dead. What? Of course he is. Of course he's dead. He couldn't very well be alive if you killed him. Oh, Cappy. Oh, you fool, you fool. Here's your brother. Here in the dumbwaiter. Look. Gone. What's gone? The body. His body was in there. It's gone. You were right, Hamilton. He's not completely mad. You'll have to help me take him away. Sit down a moment, Vane. Here, let me help you. Julie did it. Julie took the body down. She hit it, threw it in the river. She hadn't far to go. She's strong, you know. She, she used to carry me off the stage. Of course she did. Don't think about it now. She took the body down. Because she hates me. Look, Vane, I want you to come with us. Let's go, uh, No one's going to hurt you. I promise you that. No one's going to hurt you, Captain. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to prove me mad. Vane mad. To put me away. Him away. So you can have the money. I heard you, you know. I was right here when you said it. Right here. Of course you Of course you were. Oh, you fools, you stupid fools. Your brother talks like this. It's really very simple. It's really very simple. Can't you see how different it is? Of course it's different. But you're not well, Cappy. You're sick. Why won't you come with us? Julie! Julie! What have you done to me? <laughs> you said my brain would... Come along now. Wait. You hear that? My entrance music, you hear? I'm on. The dance. The champagne gag. The laughs. The bow to Julie. The kiss. The faint. The finish. The laughs. The applause. And the sign on Broadway is two miles high. The flash finish to the high class act I've always dreamed about. The biggest act of all. The perfect murder. The perfect murder. <laughs> I'm big time. <laughs> Murder Has No Tongue, starred Sherman Marks in the roles of Maxie Reed and Cappy Vane. Beverly Younger was featured as Julie Reed. Original music was composed by Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. This origination was from the WBBM studios in the Wrigley Building, Chicago. I've often joked about how, instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. 
I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like Cognizine Cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. Stay tuned now for adventure and excitement in the world of the future. It's entertainment for the entire family, produced right here in Kalamazoo. Join us now for a voyage into another dimension. A journey into a realm as infinite and limitless as time itself. Our destination, the farthest reaches of the imagination. WMUK Special Projects presents Future Tales. A double feature. First, Born of Man and Woman by Richard Matheson. Adapted especially for Future Tense by John Scott. called me wretch. I wonder what it is, a wretch. I saw in her eyes the anger. Mother is a pretty, I know. Yet in my bed place with cold walls around, I have a paper thing that was behind the furnace. It says on it, screen stars. I see in the pictures faces, like of mother and father. Father says they are pretty. Once, he said it. They are pretty. And also, mother. Yes, your mother's pretty. And me, I'm decent enough. And look at you. Look at you. It's all right, Father. Don't, don't touch me. Now, get back. <laughs> This day, Mother let me off the chain a little, so I could look out the little window. That's how I see the water falling. I see it falling all around. The ground sucks up the water like thirsty lips. It drinks too much and gets sick and runny brown. I don't like it. This is another day. This day, there is a gold ball in the blue upstairs. As I know, when, when I look at it, my eyes hurt, and, and after I look, everything in the cellar is red. I think this is church day. Uh, upstairs they leave. 
The big machine swallows them, and, and Roy's past and is gone. In the back part is the little mother. <laughs> she is much smaller than me. I am, I can see out the little window, all I like. In this state, when it gets dark, I had eat my food and some bugs. I hear laughs upstairs. I like to know why there are laughs for. I take the chain from the wall and wrap it around me. I walk to the stairs. They creak when I walk on them. My legs slip on them. I don't walk on stairs. My feet stick to the wood. I go up and open the door. It is a white place. I go in and stand quiet. I hear the laughing some more. I walk to the sound and look through to the people. More people than I thought was. I think I should laugh with them, but I trip on my chain. <laughs> oh, what are you doing up here? Where are the chips? What fell? Uh, the ironing board. Uh, come help me with it. Now, is that so heavy that you have to... He sees me. He grows big. The anchor comes in his eyes. He, he hits me. I spill some of the trip on the floor from one heart. It is not nice. It, it makes ugly green on the floor. Well, you get to the cellar. Now. I have to go. The light, it hurts some now in my eyes. This is not so like that in the cellar. Must you tie him like that? Not so tightly, Jeff. Would you like him to entertain your guests? Oh, God. And only eight years old. <laughs> This day, Father hammered in the chain before it had light. I have to try to pull it out again. Uh -huh. That should hold it. Now, you were bad to come upstairs. Do you understand? Never do that again. Never. You hear me? If you do, I'll beat you hard. I hurt. I sleep and rest my head against the cold wall. And I think of the white place upstairs. I got the chain from the wall out. Mother's upstairs. I hear little laughs, very high. I look out the window, and I see all little people, like the little mother. And little fathers, too. They are pretty. They are making nice noise and jump around. Their legs move fast. They're like mother and father. Mother says all right people look like they do. One of the little fathers saw me. He points at the window. I let go and slide down the wall in the dark. I curl up so they cannot see. I hear their talks by the window. I hear the little mother call upstairs. I hear heavy steps. And I rush to my bed place. I hit the chain back in the wall and lie down on my front. Have you been at the window? Stay away from the window. If you pull the chain out again, why do you disobey? Mother hits me with a stick. I don't cry. I can't do that. But the drip runs all over the bed. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, why have you done this to me? is upstairs, I hear the little one come slow down the steps. I hide myself in the cold bin, for mother would have anger if the little mother saw me. She has a live thing with her. It walks on her arms and has pointy ears. The live thing smells me. It looks at me and its hair stands up. In the throat it makes an angry noise. It, it jumps at me. I didn't want to hurt it. I got fear because it bites harder than the rat does. Oh, the little mother screams. I can't lie me tight. Kiss it all together. It's all lumpy and red on black coal. Kristen, where are you? I hide when mother calls. I am afraid of the stick. I creep over the coal with the thing. I hide it under my pillow and rest on it. I put the chain in the wall again. <laughs> This 
is another time. Father chained me tight. I hurt because he beat me. This time I hit the stick out of his hands and made noise. He went away. His face was white. He ran out of my bed place and locked the door. I am not so glad. All day, it is cold in here. The chain comes slow out of the wall. And I have a bad anger with mother and father. And I will show them. I will do what I did that once. I will screech and laugh loud. I will run on the wall. Last, I will hang my head down by all my legs and laugh and drip green all over until they're sorry they didn't be nice to me. If they try to beat me again, I'll hurt them. I will. Dr. Itar's Experiment, written especially for Future Tense by Martin Gingrich. Report number 276-J from Virgil Blake, Chief Investigator, Federal Bureau of Human Concerns. Subject, Dr. Itar's Experiment. Date, May 24, 2025. Time, 10.05 a.m., Washington offices of the Federal Bureau of Human Concerns, third floor conference room. Present were Andrew Nelson, Chief of the Bureau, David Churcher, Senior Statistician, Anita Bonner, head psychologist, and myself. Chief Nelson began. I'll come right to the point. Up until four days ago, we've not had one single death on this continent for 25 years. In fact, the few just at the beginning were accidental. Farmers still had to farm. Construction workers still tore down and put up buildings. Factories still had to operate. But since people don't actually handle machinery anymore, there are no fatal accidents. We have had literally no deaths. And the devil of it is everything is operating smoothly. Everyone's prosperous. No one is poor or sick or suffers. There's no possible reason for suicide. Yet, in this city alone, we have averaged ten suicides a day for the last four days. Forty-two, counting the two this morning. I only hope one of you has something I can work on. Our problem seems to be isolating the cause. Anita, it seems like it has to be a psychological cause. Our whole study so far points to what it is not. Although, of course, we can't be sure. Well, what isn't it, then? In the five years preceding the complete implementation of Dr. Itar's program, the best minds in the country weighed and argued probable results. The greatest fear, expressed mostly by artists and psychologists, was that life would become boring. Nothing new could ever develop. And because Iteran makes people sterile, we would not even have children to challenge our boredom. Creativity would cease to exist. I agreed. But at the time, most people thought it a small price to pay for eternal life, eternal youth. Even so, a few thought life without risk of death would be too tedious to bear. But with the universal application of Iterin to almost every substance taken into the human body, we said goodbye to death and the fear of death. Anyway, as soon as I received the reports on the first suicides last Thursday, I asked Dave to think of boredom as a possible cause when he examined the files of the victims. The statistics we have now will not support that theory. These suicides were not caused by depression, boredom, or hopelessness. What were they like, Dave? Any pattern? Anything you could see from their psychological profile? Well, there was a pattern, all right, Chief. A very obvious one. But it didn't have anything to do with their minds. Well, okay, well, what well, it is. Well, every one of the victims up to this morning, I still don't know about them yet, but every one of the others was a member of Dr. Itar's original group. The Itar building, with the words Home of Iterin emblazoned on its massive doors, had become a landmark practically from the moment Dr. Itar's program had been adopted by the state. Dr. Itar himself occupied the entire top floor and maintained his own laboratory in his apartment. In the first years of his residence here, the building had been heavily guarded. But when people realized that Iterin was free to everyone and readily available for the nearest water tap, the necessity for security diminished. 10.45 a.m., I entered the building and rode the elevator to the penthouse. The doors opened directly into the outer office of Dr. Itar's laboratory. Behind a reception desk sat a young woman. It was hard to tell in this day when no one aged beyond 30, but she looked younger, maybe 25. Mr. Virgil Blake, we received your tapes and your office call to say you were coming. I didn't want to surprise you. Dr. Itar is waiting in the lab. He's fed your tapes into the computer. He's so disturbed by the news of these suicides. Well, we're all disturbed, Miss... Uh, uh, I'm Nova, Dr. Itar's assistant. Well, Nova, any information we do have points straight here. 
Dr. Itar, Mr. Blake from the Bureau. What? Who? Your surprise is normal, Mr. Blake. You wonder why in the land of the young I should look so old. <laughs> what would you say, about uh, about 50? Why, yes, I guess so, but I'm out of practice. Oh, just like you, Mr. Blake, and, and all of us except Nova here, I am much older than I look. What's different about Nova? She is exactly the age she looks. All the children who are born that year, 1999, are still aging. I'd say Nova is aging quite nicely, Doctor. Oh, that's a tut, Mr. Blake. As for my own age, it looks, they are the result of my experiments on myself. Experiments on yourself? Well, now, how could I, who have given to humankind eternal life, have asked someone else to return his life to me and grow old, perhaps die? I could only experiment on myself. I understand. But why reverse the process at all, on yourself or anyone? Oh, I can explain that too, Mr. Blake. Uh, Nova, will you bring my chart from the file, please? Yes, sir. You see, I was already nearly 60 when the first crude Eiteran produced those surprising results. I was just a boy then. My father and mother had both died. My mother of cancer and my father of grief. A few years earlier, your discovery might have saved them. Science does not adhere to man's timetable, Mr. Blake. Here's the chart, Doctor. No, thank you. I was going to tell myself and how I think they relate to these suicides. For God's sake, Doctor, if you do know, tell us. People all over the world are going to go their minds. Easy, Mr. Blake. I have not heard that plea for a long time. For God's sake. Eiteran came about by accident. Actually, two accidents. What do you mean, Doctor? Well, back in the early 90s, I was working on a fertility chemical for the Kress Institute of Biochemistry and Eugenics. I discovered Eiteran by accidentally displacing one of the hydrogen atoms in acetyl salicylic acid, a substance commonly used at that time to induce insensibility to pain. Aspirin? Correct, Mr. Blake. And replacing it with an amino group. That was the first accident. The second occurred when I tried a new compound on an experimental group the following year. Was that the Cress experiment on the 400 sterile couples? Ah, you have done your homework, Mr. Blake. You're quite correct. Although we failed to achieve the desired result, we realized by the end of the year that Eiteran had produced a cessation of the aging process. So far as we could tell, these people had not aged a minute in the entire year. Some of the older couples seemed to grow younger. A few balding men grew some hair. Flaccid female skin tightened on the upper arms, around the eyes, and under the chin. And within the next year, all the members of the group looked about 30 years old. Some accidents. Well, soon, after a few more t tests, all of us older scientists at Crest took large doses of Eiteren. I was the first. Then the government took over and the whole project and made you its chief. I was absolutely convinced that then that Eiteran was safe. And I still am. And I so advised our leaders. They announced its benefits to the public. It became a campaign issue. And before long, we were putting it into the water along with the fluoride, into milk along with the calciferol, into cereal along with the riboflavin. I felt like Casimir Funk, McCollum and Davis all rolled into one. I found a true vital amine. Uh, Blake, I... Uh, what, what is it, Doctor? A Nova! A glass of water. Uh, Quick, quickly, Mr. Blake. Uh, uh, there, in the lab sink. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm all right now. The, the sudden exhilaration. I, I suddenly realized I've given the world eternal life and the eternal youth. Dr. Itar, are you sure you're okay? Oh, yes, I, I, th I think so. I'd like to know more about these latest experiments. Uh, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Blake. I I stopped taking Eiteran five years ago. Distilled water, organic vegetables, no meat, the, the whole thing. And as I expected, all the old doubts and worries, fear of death, and above all, sickness of the body, they all returned. I aged again with incredible rapidity. I do not know if, if I remain sterile or not. But last year, 
I started taking Eiterin again, and the aging has reversed somewhat, but not nearly so quickly as 30 years ago, and not enough, not enough, Blake. Uh, excuse me a moment, please. Uh, certainly. I'm so worried about him. He's been so depressed. What's that? Dr. Itar! Oh, help me with him, Mr. Blake. Oh, I... oh it's too late. Goodbye, Nova. Ich gehe zu Nova Leben. Look, Mr. Blake. He's smiling. What's in this jar, Nova? It says AS203. Arsenic trioxide. What was that he said before he... He said, I go to a new life. 11.15 a.m. I brought Dr. Itar's notes, medical charts, and Nova back with me to bureau headquarters. I was hoping for some clue, if not in the notes and charts, then in Nova's memory. Meanwhile, reports of new suicides kept pouring in from all over the world. Date, May 30th, six days later. All at once, the suicides have stopped. As David Churcher put it, they killed themselves for six days, and on the seventh day, they rested. May 31st, 7.30 p.m. The staff had made little progress, even with the study of Dr. Itar's notes. We met to review our information. Were they what? Smiling. Did they look happy? As a matter of fact, they did. A look of great joy. Could that be important? Well, if people commit suicide because life is too tough or too dreary or boring, we might be able to control it. But what in this heaven on earth do you do if they die smiling? The most obvious fact so far is that these people were all among the first to use Iterin. It would suggest that Iterin produces this peculiar effect after 30 years. Dr. Itower would have to be the exception then, because although he began using it early, he stopped for about four years. Could there have been a difference in the first Iterin? Maybe you have something, Nova. Dr. Itar said something about the first crude Iterin. I wouldn't count on that, Blake. Our chemists tell us that Iterin has had the same basic structure since its discovery. Well, then, what would you say are the significant facts, David? I'd say, for one, what Anita just said. All the victims were the first people to use Iterin. I've been thinking about that, too. Reports from around the world make it pretty clear that the original users are all, or just about all, suicides. Dr. Itar does not say in his notes how many scientists at Crest Institute joined him in experimenting on themselves. No, but I have the feeling this sudden stop in deaths means that they are all dead. If that's the case, we may have about a five-year reprieve. Small comfort in that. We still have to account for what Nova said about Itar. He stopped. He eliminated Iterin from his diet for four years. Any of us who were over 30 then can probably go any time. Maybe we should all stop taking it. Oh, but omitting Iterin caused Dr. Itar to age at least five or six times the normal rate. In five years, Anita, you and David would be nearly 60 years old. I put that down as fact number three, rapid aging. What I really want to put down is what happened to these people, to Dr. Itar and the others. I think we were right from the start about the boredom. These people were not bored. Dr. Itar, for example, worked until the end as hard as ever on his experiments. Maybe his mind slipped a few seconds before he took that poison, but I think he saw something. Saw something? Like what? I think he saw heaven. Oh, I know that sounds crazy. And no, my mind's not slipping, but just think. Standing still for 30 years. Even if you are in paradise, you eventually get restless. You want to change. Dr. Itar gave us an almost perfect life. We have enjoyed it, or at least we have not wasted it. But we thought that without death, life would be absolutely perfect. I don't understand. If you look at any other quarter century, say since 1900, what changes do you see? Dave, you were in, what, uh, 12th grade, about 1950? What was a budding science then, for instance? Well, aerospace. We laughed at the prediction that in 25 years we'd send a man to the moon. There you are. Any changes in us came from Iterin and are generally expressed in negatives. No children, no old people to worry about, no schools, no hospitals to finance. We took life easy. Do you know these ten days are the hardest I've worked in 25 years? I'd forgotten I could feel tired. But earlier, people had to work. 
struggle and fight. Advances came from battles won. You're right, Anita. In those terms, we have just stood still. That is why I think it was some sort of vision for these ecstatic suicides. The look on their faces almost proves it for me. Maybe I can't put it down as fact number four, but death is the next logical step to heaven on earth. Then Iterin affected their minds? Yes. What would happen to the mind, Anita, if suddenly there were no more Iterin? It would age, too. Grow senile. More than likely, we'd have more suicides. Many more. Remember, for 25 years, we have not had to cope with troubles or sickness, despair and death. Our choice seems to lie between death and death. If we keep on as we are, in another five years, the whole human race will commit suicide. I will almost certainly die in five years either way. I guess I will, too. The strain of such rapid aging will kill us. You, Blake, you may have a little more time. You were under 30 then. What will happen to those of us who've not reached 30? What are our choices? You are the hope of the human race, Nova. A slim one, I admit. If Iterin has made everyone permanently sterile, Nova, you will be the last of the human race. By slim hope, Dave, did you mean Nova might not be sterile? If she is, if you are, Nova, then that's it. It'll take some time to tell. If not, and that's a big if, then anyone else not yet 30 might also be able to reproduce. Terrible as it sounds, most of us are going to grow old at sickening speed. To save the human race, we'll have to eliminate Iterin completely. We'll have to die. Even then, there's no guarantee. But I have great hope, Anita. Something Dr. Itar said about Nova. The children of her year, 1999, they are still aging. That means they must still be growing, developing. And if they are, they are also creating. It's the best we have to go on. What do we do next? Remember that old expression, Dave? We pass on. We have only one choice. The world must choose and live or die with that choice. Remember, 25 years ago, they voted to do away with death. Isn't that risky? Dangerous? Letting them choose? What if they... They won't. I was wrong. At the meeting, I mean. I don't believe we really stood still. We are not what we were. When we were thrill-seekers, social climbers, money-grabbers, we chose eternal life. We aren't any of those anymore. What would be the point? Yes, I am sure of our decision. Humanity will not destroy itself just for a few painless years. I knew that as I looked again at Nova. Nova, the hope of humanity. End of report 276J, Federal Bureau of Human Concerns, 10.45 p.m., May 31st, 2025. Uh, Virgil Blake, Chief Investigator. WMUK Special Projects has presented a double feature. Born of Man and Woman was written by Richard Matheson and adapted especially for future tense by John Scott. The cast included Peg Small, Mark Spink, Cullen Bailey, and John Scott. Dr. Itar's experiment was written especially for future tense by Martin Gingrich and featured John Phillips as Virgil Blake. Others in our cast were Ruth Heinick, Richard Atwell, Peg Small, and Richard Niesink. The part of Dr. Itar was played by Mark Spink. Future Tense is produced and directed by Ellie Siegel. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Let him
Entertainment presents Gangbusters. <laughs> Gangbusters at war, marching against the underworld. From coast to coast, Gangbusters, the G-Men, our government agents, marching against the underworld. <laughs> Marching, marching, marching. These are the days when we're all marching against the forces of enemy aggression. And in our wartime duties, we can't afford to lose precious time because of muscular distress and the needless suffering involved. So be prepared, as families for more than half a century have been prepared, with your bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment. And remember, fatigue or minor accidents can bring on muscular distress, so don't take chances. Have a bottle of Sloan's liniment on hand always. Sloan's, you see, is the pat-on liniment that brings quick and comforting relief. Just pat Sloan's on the sore place and relax. You'll actually feel the grateful warmth of Sloan's go to work like a heat treatment, helping to soothe and loosen those tight, tired, aching muscles. Ask your druggist tomorrow for a bottle of Sloan's liniment. And now, Colonel Schwarzkopf to tell us the facts concerning tonight's murderer. On January 3rd, 1920, in a homey living room in Mooringsport, Louisiana, a little girl, four years old, with long black curls, stood looking down at her birthday present. A beautiful child. She looked like an angel. A neighbor sat watching her. You have lots of presents, Tony Joe. Look at my doll. Isn't she pretty? Oh, very pretty, Tony Joe. Oh, why, Tony? I break it. But why? It's not as pretty as me. I'm prettier. You, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You didn't give me the presents I want. I break them. I break them. I hate them. Twelve years passed. Tony Joe had become more beautiful, her tantrums more violent. No one could control her. She ran away from home, and in August of 1933, was hanging out in a tough dive, the Golden Nest, one mile from Houston, Texas. Hey, Red, that's the most beautiful dame I've ever seen in my life. She ain't more than 15. The face of an angel, and look at that bill. Listen, Mike. <laughs> that dame's a hellcat. That cute little trick. She lives in these joints. She's done everything you can think of. Yeah? Hey, uh, Tony Joe. Yeah? Come here a minute. Boy, is she a pimp. <laughs> Why don't you boys get up and dance and have some fun? Hey, want a drink, Tommy? Yeah. Straight with a beer chaser. Didn't I tell you, Mike? Look at that hussy at the cornic table. Oh, sit down, sit down, Tony, and talk with us. That old hag trying to act young. Get out of here! Yo, beat it! Hey, Tony, next. Give me that bottle. Easy, kid, will you? What are you doing? Hey, 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 Where'd that pal of yours go, Red? Tony, can't you go one night without brawling? You want this bottle bouncing off your head, too? Okay, forget it. Tony, you're the wildest female I ever see. <laughs> Why shouldn't I be? I'm young. I got brains and I'm beautiful. I'm going to live. I'm going to have everything all at once piled on. You can't run the world, Tony. Who says so? I got my plans. All I need is the right guy. Oh. <laughs> Come on, Red. Put a nickel in the jukebox and let's dance and have some fun. Let's live. One year later, in even a cheaper dive in South San Antonio at 3.30 in the morning... The place was deserted except for a girl who sat way back in the right-hand corner. 
A big, burly man was leaning over the bar, talking to the bartender. Kind of dead around this joint tonight, Gus. Yeah, cowboy. Will you have another snort? Might as well. And, uh, Gus, while you're at it, pour a drink for the little lady over there. No, 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 cowboy. You don't want to mix with that thing. Huh? That's Tony Joe. She's poison. What, that beautiful doll poison? <laughs> if she's poison, I'll take all I can get. I want you, cowboy. You boys talking about me? What was Gus saying? Gus tells me you're wild. You're poison. <laughs> yes? Yeah? What do you think? Now, me, I like wild cats. I like to tame them. You know how? I never met the baby yet, I couldn't him. You're the big, strong prize fighter. Or should I say, ex-prize fighter. I can still get in a ring with a pistol. You know, cowboy, there's one thing you can tell me. Sure, baby. You just ask me. They say you've been tagged on the chin so many times, you're still here canaries. Is that supposed to be funny? <laughs> Maybe Gus is right. It's too fresh. You need a good slap in the foot. Sweet, sweet. No man ever slapped me before. You low livered punk. I'll scratch you right. You shouldn't have sucked her like that, cowboy. Look at her face all smacked up. When she gets up, I'll sock her again. I ought to put a bullet in you. Yeah. But maybe you're more of a man than I thought you were. <laughs> maybe you're the guy I've been looking for. To fit into my plans. Hey, cowboy, it's coming true. Everything I planned in my life is coming true. Oh, gee, Tony Joe, I didn't know you was that nuts over me. What do you mean? You must have fallen hard, baby. Who said it's you, cowboy? My plan I'm talking about. Plan? The money I'm going to get. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Jewelry, excitement, everything. Yeah? Oh, where, where are you going to get all that stuff? You. Oh, I ain't got that kind of dough. Oh, but you're going to have money. Money, money, cowboy. Life, good time. Now, let's get this straight to What, What's on your mind? I got it all planned. But I needed a guy with nerve, cowboy, who could handle a gun. That's why I married you. A gun? First, a few gas station holdups and some banks and a kidnapping or two. You're crazy, Tony Joe. It's easy. Nothing can stop us. Nothing. A filling station robbery first. Another. Then two stores. A street holdup. Then December 14th, 1939. Tony Joe was back in San Antonio in a suite of rooms quite expensively furnished. Tony Joe! Tony Joe, open up! What's the matter, cowboy? Wait a minute, look at me. You killed somebody. A, a cop. When? Where? Just now, when I left to help her. Well, this cop grabbed me. I plugged him. They see you come here? I don't know. I... You fool. You spoiled my plans. Everything I've worked for and planned for. The hold up money, my whole life. Hey, what? Don't either of you two move. We want you, cowboy. For murder. And you for questioning, Tony Joe. The jury, having found the prisoner, Claude Henry, guilty of murder, I hereby sentence Claude Henry to 50 years hard labor at the state prison, Huntsville, Texas. 
Keep your chin up, cowboy. Keep your chin up. I'll get you out. You hear? I'll get you out. And that desire became Tony Joe's obsession to beat the authorities, to get Cowboy out so she could continue her plan. What were these desperate measures Tony Joe planned to get the Cowboy out of jail? On the night of January 28, 1940, Tony Joe went to the secret hideout of Harold Burke, the crony of the Cowboys. It was a room on the second floor of an apartment house on Western Avenue. Well, Tony Joe. Surprised to see me, Burke? Yeah. Now that your man's in jail, you've come to me, huh? Maybe. How about it, Burks, if we pal up? You do anything I say. You've always treated me like a cold fish, Tony. Did I? Well, you should help me clean out a bank, Burks. Uh-oh. And if I did help, you'd use the dough to get the cowboy out? Not necessarily. A girl can like more than one guy, can't she? You want to add me to your string? Wouldn't you like to be added? You're a devil, Tony Joe. Sure. I guess if you had a dozen guys, I'd still want to be one of a dozen. We'll pal up, Rick. I know where there are some guns. Tony Joe stole 16 guns. Then came the following night, February 14th, 1940. It was a cold, stormy night with an icy rain falling. A brand new Ford Coupe, Texas license plate, N10754, was driving along the highway between Orange, Texas and Lake Charles, Louisiana. It was 9.30 in the evening. Do you want to leave? Thanks, mister. Both of you can squeeze in here with me. Okay. All right. What a night. Okay? Ah, better than okay, mister. Just fine and dandy. Good. How far are you going? New Orleans. I'll take you as far as Lake Charles. Okay. Oh, boy, isn't it wonderful? Hey, you are happy over something, aren't you? <laughs> Wouldn't you be if things were working out again just as you wanted? Yes, I imagine... That's I... why I'll have to ask you to stop this car, mister. Huh? What for? I want it. What? Feel this gun in your side? I said stop the car. All right, all right. Don't shoot. What are you figuring on, Tony Joe? Get out. What do you want me to do? Walk into that field back of the rice sack. You saw it just now with the lightning. Wait a minute. What is this? Walk. Knock him out good, baby. I'll wait here. Now... Kneel on the ground back of this rice sack. Please, dear God. He isn't running the show. I am. My family, they'll be all alone. God help them. Watch. Tony. Tony Joe, you all right? I'm all right. That gunshot, what was it? I killed him. You killed him? Oh, we need his car to rob the bank, don't we? He'd have called the police. But it's murder. I didn't figure I'd murder. Oh, it was easy. Nothing to it. You're mad. <laughs> this is life, Burke. I'll take what I want. Nothing can stop me now, nothing. Now we'll rob that bank. No. I won't do it. I didn't figure I'd murder. You think I care about you, Burke? I'm thinking a cowboy in that jail. 
and my plan. Get in the car. I'm not going to. I'm through with you. I want no part of you, you understand? You yellow rat. <clears throat> what my plans, will you? <clears throat> you sniveling worm. Tony Joe. I've seen you in this bar for weeks. Hello, Red. What's the matter? Me? <laughs> Nothing. You don't look so peppy as you used to. I'm peppy. Sure I am. I know how to live. I'm having fun. Sure. Hmm. Have a snort? Okay. Great. Here on the side. So is this the way this guy's always been, Red? Sure. Didn't it look look brighter or more peppier or something? No. Guess it must be you, Tony Joe. How can it be me? Can't be me. I'm like I always was. Drink your drink. Uh, don't seem to get a lift out of this stuff anymore. You need a double shot. I'll pour it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I need, Red, a double shot. Give me a double shot and we'll have fun again. Sure, lots of fun. Hi, Tony. What's the idea, Red? I happened to stop in the dive downstairs, and they told me you'd been staying up in this empty room since yesterday. Didn't want to see no one. What's the matter with you? You mean what's the matter with you? What's the matter with everybody? What's the matter with the whole world? Nothing seems to be working out right anymore. You sure the trouble ain't with you, Tony Joe? Why should it be? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm just like I always was. Only I don't know. I, I, I don't get a kick out of nothing anymore. There's nothing new to do. I've done everything. Men, money, dope. I've done everything. Yeah. Yes, you have, Tony Joe. Except maybe kill a guy. Kill a guy? Well, I've done that, too. Tony. Sure, I killed a guy. There's nothing I ain't done. I've killed a guy. There ain't nothing I ain't done. You ain't kidding, kid? You really killed a guy? Oh, stop asking me. I told you once. Yes, yes, I did. It was part of my plan. Everything was going so smooth, so smooth. But now all of a sudden things seem to be closing in. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Every place is the same. There's nothing new. What will I do? Where will I go? What will I do? <laughs> Why don't you... Go to the police station, Tony Joe, and give yourself up. Why don't you keep your mouth shut? What do you want it? I hadn't thought of that. I wonder what it feels like to walk in and give yourself up. <laughs> Might be excitement. <laughs> Might even be a thrill. understand you cops are looking for me. I'm Tony Joe. That's right, Tony. You did the wise thing in giving up. Who said I'm giving up? I want to know what this is all about. Take it easy, Tony Joe. Take it easy. Here. Have a cigarette. Oh. Thanks. Now, you don't know why we want you, Tony. That's what I'm waiting for, copper. Tony, a man who was driving a brand new Ford the other night on the road to Lake Charles gave a man and a girl a lift and hasn't been seen since. Yeah? Where is he, Tony? Know some more riddles? Suppose I show you how the cards stack up. We found that car, Tony. Hmm. Fancy that. They're checking it for fingerprints. Perhaps they'll find yours, Tony. Oh, may I have your cigarette to get a light? Oh, sure. Yeah. 
They also found cigarette butts with lipstick. Perhaps it's the same brand of lipstick as on this cigarette you just gave me. Hmm? Give me that cigarette back. Oh, no. There's one thing more, Tony Joe. We're looking for Harold Burke. What? And we'll find him. You know Harold Burks won't hesitate to sing. He's that kind, Tony Joe. So you see how the cards stack up, Tony Joe? Hmm. Looks like you guys do hold all the aces. Okay. I'll talk. But I never figured it'd end this way. The owner of that car, Tony Joe. Where is he? Dead. But I wish now I hadn't have come here. I was a sap. I thought I'd get a kick out of confessing. But there ain't no fun in it. There ain't no fun in nothing. Tony Joe, you are convicted by this court of murder. The penalty is death. This is the night, Jailer. Or have you come with a reprieve? No, Tony Joe, there isn't any reprieve. I've come to take it. Oh. Well, I guess I always knew it had been my life for the man I killed. All right, Jailer. Let's start walking. I don't want to die. I haven't really ever lived. Um, sorry, Tony Joe. Wait a minute. Before you open the door to the death room, I, I want to say something. Funny. I bet most folks wonder what goes on in the mind of a condemned person. I'll tell you. Maybe it'll help somebody else. When you're locked up like this, you feel so out of everything. You get so cold. And pretty soon you're a freak. Even to yourself. I often wonder why I didn't knock that man unconscious instead of killing him. It was like being drunk. And you pull something that seems the cutest, smartest thing in the world, only it's the awfulest. I always knew there was a god running the show. And I thought I could steal one little act. Now, Tony Joe, through this door. May God have mercy on your soul. This is Colonel Schwarzkopf speaking. Tony Joe paid the penalty in the electric chair on November 28, 1942, and was pronounced dead at 12.12 12 p.m., Tony Joe, who would never learn to curb her emotions, never learn that to live life, one must play the game of life, and he who cheats will suffer the consequences. Life is meant to be lived, not stolen. <laughs> been an extremely powerful case. And thank goodness there are so few women like Tony Joe. Most women are sympathetic, helpful, and kindly. But when you're suffering from muscular distress, sympathy alone is not enough. A mother, when dad comes home and tells you his shoulder feels stiff and sore from that long overtime shift on the job, 
reach right for your bottle of Sloan's liniment on the medicine shelf. Sloan's liniment will do more to help him than all the kind words in the world. And when you yourself feel that your day's scrubbing and cleaning has seemed to tie your muscles into knots, you're mighty glad to pat on Sloan's liniment before you go through another moment of needless discomfort. That bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment promises quick and comforting relief to your entire family. You, youngsters, when you've dashed out to school without bundling up, it's good to come home to that Sloan's liniment. Because too much exposure on raw days can make even a youngster's muscles stiff and sore. So take no chances. Have your bottle of Sloan's liniment on hand always. And at the first twinge of muscular pain, pat Sloan's on the sore place. Almost immediately, you'll feel that gentle and penetrating warmth acting like a heat treatment to help soothe out the kinks in those aching muscles. And now, our nationwide clue. Indictment returned by federal grand jury charging Patrick E. O'Day with violation of federal impersonation statute. Patrick E. O'Day's real name is Paul R. Thompson. Thompson is 47, 5 feet 11 and 1 half inches, 195 pounds, light brown hair, blue eyes, has worked as showman, vaudeville entertainer, comedian, stage manager, walk-upon master of ceremonies, magazine salesman, Thompson's hair receding at temples, seldom wears hat, is convincing talker with confident manner, pretends to be federal officer. Glenn Otis Reynolds, Glenn, G-L-Y-N-N, Glenn Otis Reynolds, wanted for questioning, burglary, Glenn Otis Reynolds is 44 years old, 5 feet 7 and 3 quarter inches tall, weighs 199 pounds, heavy build, right ring finger amputated, right ring finger amputated, Glenn Otis Reynolds, 44 years old, 5 feet 7 and 3 quarter inches, heavy build, right ring finger amputated, wanted for questioning, burglary... If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. And now, here's what Phillips H. Lord has planned for next week. Gangbusters, friends, next week at this same time, gangbusters will present The Phantom of Fort Wayne, a ghostly metal voice which spoke only at night and terrified an entire city. No one could describe this creature. For whoever saw him, died. Remember that next week, Sloan's Liniment presentation of Gangbusters. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lloyd production which has originated in New York. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv.
Presenting Orson Welles as The Third Man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the motion picture The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man, yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. No. He had many lives. I can tell you about all of them. How? Because my name is Harry Lyme. Did I ever tell you about the time when I outwitted three very suspicious Wall Street investors at a net profit to yours truly of 55,000 American dollars? No? Well, I will sometime. Anyway, because of that little caper, I decided that an ocean trip would be good for my nerves and for the nerves of some half-dozen New York detectives. That's how I happened to go on a holiday. A rogue's holiday, if you will. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man in Rogue's Holiday. Very pleasant. A day or so out of New York, aboard the Queen Anne, bound for Southampton. I was on the passenger list as J. Harrington Lyme. I ate, of course, at the captain's table. Remembering how I'd put the investments of those three Wall Street brokers in my own personal piggy bank, whenever I was asked... And uh, what business are you in, Mr. Lyme? I would smile to myself and answer, I'm an investment broker, Lady Barbara. It is the Lady Barbara Folliot, isn't it? Yes, of course. I thought we'd met. Aren't you also sitting at the captain's table? Yes, that's right. And I seem to remember that there's an empty chair at the table next to yours. You're, you're not traveling alone. I, uh, it's of no importance. Uh, you are on a holiday, Mr. Lyme? A holiday? Well, after a manner of speaking, yes. I don't understand. I'm so interested in my work, Lady Barbara, that I'm seldom able to keep from mixing pleasure and business. Oh, you seem so young to be engaged in so complex a business. Investment banker. Mm. I always thought all bankers were portly men in their 50s. Well, every banker must be able to inspire confidence in his clients, Lady Barbara. The incompetent banker relies on his appearance and his maturity. And you? I rely on my record of success, ma'am. No hurry. No hurry at all. Not while I was on my holiday. Pleasant boat, Queen Anne, scheduled to take six days to Southampton. She was. I had plenty of time. But the question of Lady Barbara Folliot's bank account and the question of the empty chair next to it, the captain's table, preyed a bit on my mind. So I looked at the passenger list. There she was, all right. Lady Barbara Folliot, stateroom A deck, stateroom for two right now. And all it said was... And companion. Hmm. And companion. What did that mean? Not a husband, surely. Looked up the steward for a stateroom. Yes, sir. Uh, steward, you're in charge of the staterooms along this corridor, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yes, now, number six. I believe that's Lady Barbara Folliot's stateroom, isn't it? I believe yes, so. Now, I was wondering, just idle curiosity, you know, on the passenger list, she's down as traveling with a companion. But he doesn't say who the companion might be. You don't, sir. Uh, steward. Yes, sir. Here, take this for your trouble. Thank you, now, sir. Now, then... Would you tell me who her companion is? No, sir. Not me, sir. Uh, will that be all? Uh, yeah, just a minute now. Yes, After sir. After all, old man, I slipped you a ten dollar bill just for a bit of information. The I... lady in question, sir, slipped me a double sawbuck not to give out that information, sir. A double sawbuck? Twenty dollars, sir. Ah, yes. Well, then, I'll just take this for your trouble. Hmm? Thank you, now, sir. Now, then, about Lady Barbara's companion. You were planning a little anky-panky, no doubt, sir. Anky panky. Worried, were you, sir, lest the companion might be the husband of the lady in question? Mm, uh, yes, something like that, yes. Looking for a little shipboard romance, no doubt, sir. <laughs> That's it. Now, who's the companion? You've got clear sailing, sir. The companion's not her husband. Matter of fact, sir. Uh, yeah. Take my advice and wait till the companion's got her sea legs, sir. A lot cuter, the companion, than Lady Barbara, sir. Uh -huh. huh. Thank you, Stuart. Good at all, sir. <laughs> 
So in the next day or so, I found opportunities for squiring Lady Barbara around the boat, cocktails in the evening, a drink or two after dinner, even a game or two of deck tennis in the afternoon. Something she'd said made me prick up my ears and redouble my attentions to her as a prospective, uh, shall I say, client. We were having brandy in the lounge after dinner. Uh, the other day, Mr. Lyon... Yes? You were saying that what you relied on to inspire your clients with confidence... Was my continuing success, yes, that's right. I must say, you you inspire me with confidence. Well, that's half the battle for an investment banker like me. Have you some problem with your own investments? Uh, to be frank, uh, yes, I have, Mr. Lyon. Uh, we must talk of it further tomorrow. Well, why not now? Uh, thank you. I should like to, but the truth is, I must spend... Ah, time... your companion. Uh, the reason for the empty chair next to you at the table. Hmm? Yes, I... She hasn't her sea legs yet, hmm? How did you know it was she, not he? Well, it's, uh, it's no matter. You'll probably be meeting her tomorrow. If she takes a liking to you, Mr. Lyme, as I have, then perhaps we can do some business. That is, if you want to. Any way I can be of service, Lady Barbara. Next morning, I ran into their steward, and he told me that both ladies were out promenading. Some caution, I went looking for them. True, I was on holiday, but still, if I could turn my hand to a piece of business. Besides, I was curious about this mysterious companion whose name was not even carried on the passenger list. Turning a corner on the promenade deck, I nearly bumped into them. Quickly, I ducked back behind a bulkhead as they passed. Oh, my princess. So, her companion was a princess. Uh -huh. For the rest, I'd seen that she wore a veil close over her hair and face, but no veil could conceal that beauty. And I'd seen something else that interested me, too. A string of pearls, matched pearls. I maneuvered into position for the next round on the promenade. Uh, Lady Barbara. Oh, oh, good morning, Mr. Lyme. Anne, this is the nice man I've told you about who's been so kind to me. Uh, Mr. Lyme, this is Miss Jones. How do you do, Mr. Lyme? I am pleased to meet you. Miss Jones? Such an ordinary name for such an extraordinary young lady. <laughs> he makes nice speeches, Barbara, just as you said he did. Uh, perhaps you'll permit me to join you? Oh, I'm so sorry. We were just going in, Mr. Lyme, weren't we, Barbara? Well, then at least, Miss uh, uh, Jones, maybe you will join me and Lady Barbara this evening before dinner. Uh, Mr. Lyme, insist on the practice of buying me a cocktail before dinner, I am. <laughs> Why, I should like that. Only as to cocktails, the ship's doctor told me that perhaps until I am stronger, I should drink champagne. Perfect. I'll make sure there's a bottle of ice for you, Miss... Miss uh, Jones. Miss Jones, eh? I was sure that while that name Jones was a phony, the pearls weren't. This was promising to become one of the more profitable holidays I'd spent. That evening, I was in the lounge early, a bucket of iced champagne by my side. Mr. Lyme, as you promised, my wine. Uh, it's vintage, Miss Jones. I think it should be adequate. Uh, no, Lady Barbara? Oh, she was a little indisposed. She sends her regards. Please sit down, Stuart. I confess, Miss Jones, I'm not too sorry Lady Barbara's not joining us tonight. So? I was looking forward so to meeting you. You'd become a lady of mystery. And having met you this morning on the promenade deck, I spent the day looking forward to chatting with you. Oh, evening. more pretty speeches. <laughs> uh, um, all right, sir? Yes, fine, fine. Now, uh, fine. Thank you. If the wine meets with Miss Jones' approval. Uh, Miss Jones knows little of wines, Mr. Lyon. She is content to leave such matters to you. You have won Lady Barbara's confidence, and that means that you have won mine, too. Then a toast to your improved health, Miss uh, uh, Jones. Now, why do you always pause, as if you do not remember my name? Oh, my apologies. Very rude of me. I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> I accept your... Oh! What is it? Well, my string of necklaces. It, it broke. Oh, my pearls. Oh, oh here. All... Here, look out. Just, just hold still. You know how many of them there were? Now, don't move. <laughs> yes, yes, there were 64. Just so we can make sure none of them have rolled under the... Here. Yeah, here's another. Oh, such a stupid thing. No, I really must have... Please, please, just... here. Here's another. Steward. Oh, uh, no, no, it is all right. I think... I think that's all of them. Let me see. Quickly, that's five, ten, fifteen. Uh, yes, uh, sir. Just hang on a second, will you? The lady's string of pearls broke. It may be that one or two are still missing oh, somewhere. I, I have never know. done such a bit. Oh. Is a, such a foolish thing. Fifty-five and five is sixty and one, two, three, four. Yes, that is the whole lot of them. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, uh, lucky thing, ma'am. Oh, Mr. Lyme, do me a great favor. Anything at all. I say you're sure they're all here. Oh, yes, sure. Uh, take them, will you? You have an envelope, perhaps, or a safe pocket? Take them for me to the little jewelry shop. You know the one right on the stairs. Oh, sure, sure. I know the shop, but... Uh, uh, maybe it's still open. 
You can have the man restring them properly on a strong loose string. Or would you do that? Well, I'm not sure I like the idea, really, of wandering around the ship with a handful of loose pearls. These look like the real thing. Oh, no, no, they will be perfectly safe. Now, won't you call me such a little favor? If the shop should still be open, please? Leave you? Oh, I shall sit here quite quietly, just thinking how lucky I am that you were with me when the string broke, until you return. All right? All right. I'll be back as soon as I can. Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man. And now, Orson Welles, as the third man, continues with Rogue's Holiday. So there I was, by myself, free as the wind, with 64 pearls in my pocket. Even one of them, one of the bigger ones, be worth, well, 5,000 pounds, something like that. Nice sum. My stateroom, I had some loose pearls, paste. I could have made the switch easily enough, had plenty of time. And a stupid thief might have done just that. But not Harry Lyon. Oh, no, no. I'd play it smart. I'd wait till later. Went straight to the ship's jeweler. String broker? If you could do a quick but good repair job, old man, I'd be most grateful. Oh, it's easy enough. Just take a moment. Just roll them out here. Hmm. Good ones, aren't they? Well, they look it, don't they? Yes. To an expert's eye, they're very handsome indeed. How much would you estimate that string to be worth, old man? <laughs> if you were to just walk into this shop and ask to buy them, do yeah, you mean? Yeah. Or... Uh, or if you wanted me to find you another 64 like them. No, just walk in and buy them. 50,000 pounds? Oh, I'd say this string uh, closer to 150,000, sir. Well, I was a pretty rich man there for a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> there you are, sir. Yes. That string shouldn't break very quickly. Thank you very much. What do I owe you? Oh, forget it, sir. It's a privilege to be handling those pearls, even if only for a moment. It would have been foolish for me to temper with his fortune while we were still aboard ship two days we'd be in Southampton, at which there'd be still plenty of time. The important thing was to get this, this lovely girl's confidence, which I most certainly did. And the second thing was to pry under her incognito. Who was she? Which princess of the blood was anxious to conceal her identity under the plebeian name of Jones? And why? Not until the last night, when the ship was gliding into the soft darkness past Plymouth, when the two of us stood under a sickle moon on the boat deck, did I find out. If she looked lovely in that moonlight... Her pearls looked even lovely. Oh, what a wonderfully soft moon. I hadn't noticed. You had not? Oh, the band has begun playing again. It has? Can't you hear it? What's the matter with you? Well, I need all my five senses for something more important than looking at nights or listening to dance bands. Oh, no, no, Mr. Lyon. Harry. Oh, no, Harry, you must know. If the night is warm, it's because it must be to afford you a warm mantle. If the band is playing, it's only to provide a setting for your voice. Miss uh, Jones. My name is... Yes. Anne. Don't move. Please. What price the warmth of the night or the music of the band? Oh, you... You kiss very expertly, Mr. Harry. Or, or should I say you seem very practiced. If a cat may look at a king... Yes? Then perhaps it's all right. If I kiss a princess. Oh, you recognized me. Well, I knew you were a princess, not your name, if that matters. But you are uncanny, Mr. Lyon. Harry. Um, since you have gotten this far and since you have shown yourself trustworthy, I can see no reason for not telling you anymore. I am Anne de Bourbon, princess of Helwigstein. At your service, ma'am. You have heard of our principality? It is in eastern Germany. Beyond the Iron Curtain. I should say it was this no more. It's all gone except... Except what? I'm not sure. I will not know until I meet my husband in London. If I meet my husband. If? Well, there's uh, some doubt. I have said too much already, Mr. Lyme. It is too bad. It has been a pleasant evening. I was almost able to forget for a moment. Good night. <laughs> She was gone, just like that. At least I knew now who she was. 
whether I'd be able to find her again in London, whether I'd frightened her away, and whether my chance at that string of pearls by letting her know that I knew she was a princess, all these things I was a little nervous about. Till next day, just as I was getting ready to disembark in Southampton, Lady Barbara came up to me rather quickly. Uh, Mr. Lyme, here, a note. A note from... Uh, read it, please. After last night, I've been worried for fear I, I might just possibly have said something which, you know, might, might have offended your friend, Miss uh, Jones. Offended her? Oh, read the note. The note paper bore a crest to Colin Matthews, one sheet of heavy paper folded once. There was no salutation. The note said, As you said, a cat may look at a king. It might be interesting and fun to experiment once more with your other statement, the one about a princess. There was no signature. But none was necessary. Do you feel better? Uh, yes, but... She uh, asked me to tell you that we would be stopping at the Carlton. We'll hope to see you then. So she had arranged that we should meet again, after all. But when we met again, away from the dangerous confines of an ocean liner, I proposed to relieve her lovely neck of those lovely pearls. Oh, sure, I was on a holiday and sentiment was involved, but... These were factors that had to be disregarded. My scheme was foolproof. As it turned out, the scheme wasn't needed. The first time I saw her in the sitting room of her Carlton suite... Mr. Lyme. Oh. <laughs> All right, Harry. Harry, you have already done me one favor. I hate to ask I've you, I've but... told you I'm at your service, Miss uh, Jones. No, no. Call me, Anne, please. Right. If you want me, Highness, I shall be... At... Oh, no, no, don't leave, Barbara. Stay with us. You know the favor I have to ask of Harry anyway. I yes, started me. to say anything short of murder, Anne. No, no, it's nothing like that. First, listen. On shipboard, you remember, I told you I was to meet my husband. If, you said. Hmm? Yes, if. This is the if. Years ago, Harry, when the Red Army was driving through East Germany, we had to flee. My husband ate what was valuable that we had. Jewels and gold plate, a pitiful collection, really. But all we had. He hid it himself. He alone knew where was he. <laughs> he trusted in those days no one. Then, a few weeks ago, we planned to get it back. It would cost us a lot, we knew. Bribes, the purchase of a plane, fee for the pilot, more bribes and always more bribes. Klaus had to fly into Helvigstein, don't you see, himself. A mad and dangerous idea. I think so. But he refused to tell anyone else where his cachet was. He could not trust anyone. I went to America to raise some funds that was needed. Mm. Lady Barbara has been good enough to lend us more. But just today, I have learned that even more is needed. More money? Oh, Mr. Lyme, say no quickly if you cannot do me this favor. But I have exhausted all my other resources. If you knew how much it costs to bribe these officials over here... Oh, I bet. How, how much do you need? Oh, you will do it? It's just a loan, mind you. It's a pleasure. Lady Barbara's investment will bring her all we need at the first of the next quarter, and then I can repay you... Please, please, how much do you need? Ten thousand American dollars. It is too much? No, I don't think so. No, no, certainly not. And see, for security, oh, for no. security on your loan or here, you will take this, my pearls. You have already once guarded them well. Oh, please, I... I wouldn't dream of... Yes, I insist. Otherwise, I will not even ask you for the loan of the 10,000 American dollars. Oh, oh well, if you insist. Yes. Here, take them. Now, how can we arrange to get the money? Well, I have more than that here in the hotel safe in American dollars, too. Just let me ring the desk. <laughs> a trip downstairs in the lift. Elevator to you, back up again to my room and over to hers. I handed her ten bills. She handed me the pearls. We smiled, shook hands on the deal, and I walked out of her room with a fortune in my pocket. I call for a celebration. Pal of mine runs a pub saloon to you in London. I use it as a sort of message center. I have letters sent me there. My pal knows all the gossip who's in town, who swindled whom, all the news. I need my business, so I, I went straight to him. Harry, I haven't seen you for Afternoon, months. Afternoon, Barney. Give me a whiskey and soda, double whiskey and soda. None of your bar whiskey. either. something good. One for yourself. I'm celebrating. So am I, man. So am I. I'm celebrating your return. Oh, well, good. How long have you been in England? Oh, just a little uh, while. Too hot for you in the States, was Look, it? Look, can we have a drink somewhere in private? Yeah, sure. Why not? Follow me. Got onto something good, have you? I'll be leaving London pretty quick, Barney. 
I have to go to Europe, France, I guess, maybe Italy. Why, you've only just got here. I pulled a quick one. They may be looking for me in London sooner than I like to think. Uh Uh-huh. What for? Unless it's something you think I shouldn't know about. Look, Barney. Well, now, aren't they beauties? Uh, real thing, aren't they? I had them priced by a jeweler who said he'd ask 150,000 pounds for them. Oh, that should keep you in cigarettes for a week or two. Not bad. Not bad at all. Not half bad. Not, uh... In fact, a quarter better. Let me have a look. Do you mind? Look them over all you want, Barney. I'll fence them in Paris somewhere. This is your last look, old man. Uh Uh-huh. Where did you say you got them? Off a German princess. She gave them to me as a security on a loan. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. German princess, is it? Mm, Yes, French-born, I think. French-born, you think? Yes. Name of what? Uh, Anne de Bourbon, princess of (laughs) Elvigstein. Yes, very good. Uh, (laughs) What's so funny? (laughs) What's so very funny? <laughs> Andy Bourbon. Princess the Elwingstein. <laughs> all right, old man. All right. Better let me in on the joke. <laughs> I thought these pearls looked funny. Although you said they weren't jam. You're I... crazy. I... Well, Barney, I had them priced myself. Maybe you had some pearls priced, but not these, me boy. You've been had. The oldest trick in the world. Pulled on you, Harry Lime. Now, you're lying. Now, don't try to pull your tricks on me, Barney. A joke's a joke, but... Oh, I don't have to. It's been pulled already. Harry, me bucko, I know who Andy Bourbon is. I know who the Princess von Elwigstein is, too. She's a slick little article. Oh, no. But she ain't German. She's not French-born, and I don't think you'll ever find any Elwigstein on no map. She's Doris Jones, oh. that's who she is, and she was born right here in Clapham, that's where she was born, and she took you and shook you for, uh, how much? I gave her 10,000 American dollars. I don't believe you. I'll die. <laughs> the oldest gang in the world and pulled on none other than Harry Lime himself. I'll die. <laughs> Room th- 316, please. Harry, when this news gets around, boy. That's right, I'm calling Miss Jones. No, never mind. Oh. Well, do I win me bet? And did you lose your 10,000 American dollars? Yes. All I've got are these... these pearls. Oh, better than nothing, Gary. It's, it's a good imitation. Must be worth 50 pounds. 50 pounds? Well, I'm on my holiday. I come out ahead after all. What? Well, what about your 10,000 American oh, dollars? Your slick little article from Clapham tries to pass that 10,000, Barney. They're counterfeit. That'll teach Miss uh, Jones to try anything fast with Harry Lyme. Harry Lyme returns in just a moment. Harry Lyme. Well, it seems that Miss uh, Jones found herself a legitimate prince, one of those exiles in Portugal, and settled down with him in Lisbon. I ran into her at Estoril a couple of seasons later. She was a real princess now. But it seems his highness isn't as young as he was and probably never was, so the princess is very democratic. She asked me to their place for dinner, said she thought I'd be interested in some of the interior decorations. I was. She complimented me on my nice set of pearl studs, which she recognized, and showed me into the cloakroom, which was entirely wallpapered in American $10 bills, or a reasonable facsimile. I recognized them. No hard feelings, you understand. It's a pleasant little caper, and I always enjoy moving about amongst the upper classes. It's so educational. Well, goodbye for now. Don't take any lead nickels. And remember, if you can't manage to resist temptation, be sure you get it appraised. Keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. 
It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Fifteen years I've put up with that snoring. Fifteen bloody years. She was quite attractive when I married her, even though she'd been with other men. And now she's fat. And she smells of cheap scent and sweat. Nancy, my wife, must have been mad. Never thought I'd end up like this. A tobacco is just scraping a living. Receding air, I'm an ugly, fat bitch for a wife. I hate her. My God, I do hate her. <laughs> That's right, you bitch. That's right. Take all the bedclothes, take everything. Take, take, take. That's your middle name. If only. It's the story of my life. If only I'd done this, if only I'd done that, met someone else, been somewhere else. If only, if only, if only we'd have had children. The child's a genius. I told you, an absolute genius. And my dear, what's even more startling is she's the daughter of a tobacconist in Notting Hill somewhere. You can't be serious. I told you it was amazing. The child has all that talent and comes from nothing. <laughs> Esmeralda. Like a little fairy, you dance. Esmeralda Broom. A genius. Likely to be greater even than Pavlova herself. They all threw flowers, shouted and stamped, and all for my little Esmeralda. That dried up old spinster isn't going to start playing her bloody piano this time of night, is she? <coughs> oh, 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 what's that? Miss Hickman, dear. Oh, this time of night? It's not even 11 o'clock. Well, she's not going to disturb my sleep, I can tell you. Get up. Knock on the ceiling, Felix. She'll probably pack it in in a minute. <sighs> Felix. Oh, all right. The pole's over there. Knock. Oh, louder, Felix, louder. Oh, 
Oh, I should think so too. Thoughtless old bitch. Go to sleep, my love. No, no one walks over me, I can tell you. No one. Good night, dear. Oh, good night. Oh. Even just turning over the smell of her makes me sick. Cheap perfume, sickly, clinging to everything. The sheets, the furniture, every bloody thing. Between that rigid virgin upstairs and this sexless lump beside me, what room is there for a real man in this place? Caught a back some little wench, I see, eh? <laughs> hey, she'll see you all right, yeah? <laughs> cool, yeah. Plenty to get your hands on there, mate. That was when we first got engaged. The fellas thought I was the luckiest bloke around for miles. Vengeance has been cruel. If only they could see me now. Ugh, there I go again. If only. There she goes again. I can't stand it. Fifteen years. Fifteen years of this. No. No more. No more. You hear me, Nancy? Fat woman. No more. <laughs> Esmeralda Broom's her name. Yeah. The child's a genius, and what's even more startling is that she's the daughter of a tobacconist in Notting Hill somewhere. What's her name again? Esmeralda. Her name's Esmeralda Broom. Christ. Just listen to it. Quiet. Absolute quiet. Listen to it, Felix. Just listen to the quiet. Oh, that. Oh, my God. Oh, scared the life out of me. Five past six. Time to open the shop. I, I've been asleep. I, I killed her. I went to sleep. I must get downstairs, open up. No one must suspect. I must get dressed as usual and go downstairs as usual and sort out the papers. Oh, it's you, Miss Hickman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Broom. What can I do for you? Well, I'd like to speak to Mrs. Broom, please. Mrs. Broom? Uh, yes. I I'm afraid you can't. <laughs> what do you mean, I can't? Oh, she's not well. Oh? Tummy upset. Could be gastroenteritis. I don't know. Oh, I see. Uh, well, I'll wait until she's better. I wanted to talk to her about last night. Last night? Uh, yes, Mr. Broom. You're knocking on the ceiling. I take it it was you. It was, Miss Hickman. Then I'll take it up with Mrs. Broom when she gets better. I think you'd better take it up with me, Miss Hickman. It was I who knocked. It was I who decided to knock. Oh, was it indeed? Yes. Does that surprise you? A little, yes. Your piano playing was disturbing my wife. It wasn't even eleven o'clock. I believe I'm right in saying that any excessive noise after 10.30 is the time when one has the right to complain. I don't think you can describe my piano playing, which is the one small pleasure I get from life these days, as excessive noise. Well, I'm afraid I do, Miss Hickman. And it was particularly annoying when my wife was doubled up in pain at the time. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your wife, Mr. Broom, of course. But I wasn't to know that she was feeling unwell. Whether my wife is ill or fit is quite beside the point, Miss Hickman. Now, I'm asking you for the last time to stop playing the piano at such an hour. If you don't, then I'm afraid I shall have to take the matter up with a solicitor. Oh. Do I make myself clear, Miss Hickman? Perfectly, Mr. Broom. Good day. Good day. And Miss Hickman? Yes? All being well, both Mrs Broom and myself will be going away for a few days. 
We haven't decided how long for, but clearly we both need a rest. We've only just decided this morning. So, as a special dispensation, you can play that damn piano of yours when you like, but only till we come back. Good day. Well, really. There we are, Nancy. Out the way for good. Oh, the size of the hole I had to dig to accommodate your man of flesh nearly killed me. But I did it. I did it because I've changed. Oh, I've changed all right. What I did last night, I should have done a long time ago. Oh, I'd better go upstairs and have a bath. Lock the door to the cellar. And throw away the key. <laughs> that reminds me. I can't remember bolting the front door to the shop. Better go and see. God. A bloody awful perfume still fills the place. I can't get away from here quick enough. I was right. I didn't lock the door. Good God. Who's that? Who's there? How do you do, Father? Esmeralda. Can I come in? Thank you. You'd uh, better close the door and lock it. Uh, yes. Yes. It's stronger. The perfume's stronger. Uh, Esmeralda? Yes, Father. Where are you going? Upstairs, of course. To the bedroom. Is this a dream? <laughs> Perhaps I'm going mad. <laughs> I've, I've dreamed about you often. I never thought you'd ever be sitting here with me. Looking so... Beautiful? Yes. So beautiful. Dear father, don't be so surprised that I've come to you at last. After all, there was only one thing that ever kept me away. There was? Of course, mother. But she's safely out of the way now, isn't she? Oh, I always hoped you'd do that to her someday, father. She was such an ugly bitch. Uh, just a minute. I can't think straight. Now, look... <laughs> Look, uh, stop laughing. Uh, stop laughing, will you? I want to think. I can't think. Please, stop laughing. You see, Father, I would only have been the same as her. You signed the paper, you know. Do you remember? Fifteen years ago, you said that any children you and Nancy had would be brought up to be like her. We might have been all right at the very beginning. She was quite presentable then, wasn't she? And she didn't stink. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh, you do. Of course you do. Do you think I don't know you after all these years? You liked her body a lot at the beginning, didn't you? Do you remember the first time you saw her without her clothes? That time when you went to Brighton for a day and missed the last train home? And you went to a hotel and registered as Mr and Mrs Broom? It was before you were married, Father. Oh, my God! I hated her body! Not at first, Father. You can't pretend that you hated it at first. It was only later when she began to... Well, Father, when you began to grow old. Who are you? My father. I'm your own dear daughter. Don't you recognise me? You've seen me hundreds of times in your dreams. You've even heard people talk about me. I'm Esmeralda. No. No, you're not. You aren't Esmeralda. Esmeralda is a little girl. I mean, I've always thought of her as a little girl. If I could have... I mean, if Nancy could have... <laughs> I told you to stop that. Stop it. Oh, Father, you haven't known in the least bit what it's been all about, have you? You've thought it was all something else. You've sat in your shop downstairs and you've read stories in the magazines you sell and you've thought it was something else altogether. Poor old father. 
Shall I tell you something? No. I don't believe in you. Shall I tell you the story of your life? The real story of your life? No. Go away. I don't want to listen to you. You're not Esmeralda. What are you doing? Coming closer to you, Father. No. Go away. That's not the way to speak to your daughter. Now. I'll sit here at your feet and tell you the story of your life. Do you remember, oh, some 30 years ago? You were 15, you'd just left school. You were apprenticed to a draper in the Harrow Road Carradines. You were very shy. You used to blush if anyone spoke to you. And the girls mm. called you baby face. Mm. Do you remember that, Father? Do you? For instance, do you remember Miss Doby? Stop it. <laughs> Please, stop. But I'm only just beginning. You can't stop me now. There's such a lot to say. Don't you remember the ladies' combinations? <laughs> Miss Doby was 28 and you were just 16. She was a bitch, wasn't she, Father? All the men said so. The way she used to talk to you made you go into the underwear window and dress the dummies in Carradine's special line in ladies' combinations. In full view of the public, too beastly, wasn't it? You hated her, Father. But you couldn't help yourself, could you? She was too powerful for you. That night, when she led you to her room, smuggled you into the ladies' hostel she lived in at Earl's Court, do you remember it? Father... Are you listening? Yes. Yes. You were trembling all the time. It was all so new. Well, you were only 16. Oh, for Christ's sake, stop it. It's filthy. Stop it. It's the story of your life, Father. It's why you killed Mother. Oh. And, Father, it's why you created me. Oh, my God. No. Go away. Poor Father. Poor, poor father. You hardly knew all this, did you? You never had a real chance. After Miss Doby, it was Alice. Do you remember Alice? You and she at the dance palais, just after your 21st birthday, learning the Charleston. Do you remember that long, spangly dress she wore, cut square at the neck and with a low waist? And when you danced the last waltz, when the lights were low and you were very close to her, so close that your face was buried in her hair and it filled your nostrils, Father. It was like that deep, dark tobacco, all stringy but fragrant. You couldn't get enough of the scent of her. Oh, you devil. Why? Why? I'm only telling you, Father. I'm letting you know, that's all. It isn't what people imagine it to be, is it? Nothing ever is, of course. Not quite, anyway. Oh, it was glorious last night, wasn't it, Father? That magnificent moment. What do you mean? You hmm? know what I mean. When you lay on the pillow and put your hands round her throat, she was in your power. At last it was that way round. Someone was in your power instead of it being the other way, you in somebody else's power. That's what made it, wasn't it, Father? I don't believe this. It's not happening. All day I've been working in the shop, planning the next move, preparing for the future with her, without her. And now... Yes, Miss Doby and Alice, and the strange girl you met when you were on holiday that time in Western Supermare. Margie, her name was, and Enid, that you met at your cousin's farewell party when she went to Canada. And finally, Nancy. It was always the same, wasn't it, Father? They wouldn't leave you alone. Not any of them. They're all the same. <laughs> Esmeralda, please, Esmeralda, oh, for God's sake, don't say any more, don't say it, go away, leave me, you're different, it isn't you saying these things, here's the strain, I'll go, I'll go away, just let it get away from this bloody room, it'll be alright then, don't go on about these things, for Christ's sake, don't say any more. 
Isn't she wonderful? Like a fairy. Just like a fairy. Only 14, too. Only 14, A too. sweet child. A sweet child. A genius. A genius. Amazing. Why amazing? The daughter of a tobacconist from Notting Hill. Never. Yes, I read it in the papers. A sweet child like that from nothing. <laughs> Poor father. One illusion must be left. It's always the way, isn't it? The strongest man must always preserve at least one illusion. And you aren't a strong man, father, are you? You're the weakest man in the world. Oh, you don't remember, do you? You can't see far enough down, can you? And even if you could, you couldn't piece things together, could you? They wouldn't make sense even if you did. Things never make sense, not real things. It's all a jumble. It doesn't connect. Yet sometimes, if you look at it all quickly, there suddenly seems to be a sort of thread. The little girl, father. The kernel of it. You were 14. It was at school... And do you remember you were made to sit beside her for a punishment and she smiled at you when the teacher wasn't looking and she had a little string of cheap glass beads round her neck and they were green and she told you that they were emeralds. Do you remember that, Father? And mark it, emeralds. And you were reading a book in school that year, dreadfully dull, you thought, but they made you read it. Notre Dame du Paris. It was about a hunchback. And it seemed to you there was something infinitely pitiable about that hunchback. There was something wrong with him. He was despised by everyone. He was just like you, Father. Did you hear me? Yes. What was that? Yes. Speak up. I can't hear you. Yes. Yes. Yes, Father. They all despised him. Except one, the girl. Do you remember the girl in that book? She was different. She was poetry. She was romance. She was all the warm and lovely things. She was beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Do you remember her name, Father? Oh, come, Father. You're bound to remember her name. It was... Desdemona. Oh, Father, you disappoint me. You always get the two mixed up. No, Desdemona was the other time, don't you remember? The other time you sat beside the little girl. It was when they took you all to the theatre that afternoon and you were so tremendously excited. You'd never been to the theatre before, though you had heard about it. You thought you were going to see dancing girls, didn't you, Father? But it wasn't anything like that at all. It was educational. It would be, since the school arranged it. And it was a play by Shakespeare. It was Desdemona who was the girl in that. Her husband smothered her with a pillow from the bed. You always got mixed up with the other girl, the girl in the book. Their names were so alike. Don't you remember... She was called... Esmeralda. Yes, that's right, Esmeralda. Clever father. And the little girl sat beside you, father, and she was dressed in white that day, and she had a little bag of sticky sweets, and she gave you some. And do you remember, she wriggled in her seat... And her dress slipped up over her knees, and you sat there beside her father, and you looked at her, and you thought... Father, look at me. Look at me, father. Do you remember that girl in white? You said she was just like a little fairy. No. No. Look at me, father. She wriggled in her seat. Uh, no, please. Like this. Uh. <laughs> and her dress slipped <laughs> up over her knees. Just like this. Uh, no. Look, Father, look. No. perfume is everywhere. It covers everything. 
It stinks. It stinks to high heaven. No! Must have smashed everything in sight. Going berserk? I think you can safely assume that, Sergeant. Look at the place. Looks as if a bomb's hit it. I thought it must have been him digging in the cellar that ripped his hands like that. Oh, no, there were glass cuts. There were slivers of glass stuck everywhere. He rushed out of that shot like a bat out of hell. He practically dragged me down the cellar steps, and then he asked me to stand and watch him, and then, right in front of me, he dug in the floor like a, a dog after a bone. And there she was. His wife. He said he suffocated her. Well, Sergeant, I don't think there's much else we can do here. We know why he murdered his wife, what he was planning to do afterwards. We know that remorse, guilt, whatever one likes to call it, played on his mind for 24 hours. So much so, he couldn't live with himself. People are bloody funny, sir. I mean, who'd have thought it of him? What do you mean? He's such an insignificant little man, a nobody. And yet he does something like this. Nothing's what it seems, Sergeant. There are things bubbling away beneath the surface all the time. Then one day, when one least expects it, they explode. And something like this happens. Not often, I hope. Often enough to keep us in work, Sergeant. Come on, let's get back to the office. I've got a wife and kids waiting for me. If only he'd had a couple of kids waiting, things might have been different for him. Perhaps. I can't help feeling sorry for him. Why? All he can do with people like that is despise them. Come on, Sergeant. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio